Good evening, everyone. Let's get settled in here. Welcome to our SVCE Clean Energy Board of Directors meeting for November 13th. I like to call the meeting to order. It's about, let's see, 7.03. And uh, we'll start with roll call, please. Yes, thank you. Chair Abacoga? Here. Vice Chair Miller? Here. Director Montano? Here. Director Elahi? Here. Director Sayok? Here. Director Smith? Here. Director Sinks? Here. Alternate Director Tyson? Here. Director Gibbons? Here. Director Bruins? Present. Director Ellenberg? Here. Thank you. I'll note Director Martinez Beltran and Tovar are currently absent. Great, thank you. Uh, we move on to public comment on matters not listed on the agenda. The public may provide comments on any item not on the agenda. Speakers are limited to three minutes each. And I do have a speaker card from James Taluya. Welcome. Hi. Good evening. James Taluya, resident of Sunnyvale. And this microphone seems to be louder than normal. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so I just wanted to call your attention if you did not already know about it. Um, just a week ago, Tuesday, published in the journal Bioscience, an article called uh, World Scientists Warning of a Climate Emergency, has very good, very simple information and charts on both the um, change in global human activities for the last 40 years, so 1979 to present, on many different indicators. Um, it, you can Google that. I didn't bring printouts for everybody. but. Um, it looks like this, and these are figures one and two of the, uh, of the article. But it's very useful for helping to educate the public and others who are not yet aware of the status of a climate emergency. Uh, I was just recently with my parents uh, two miles from the evacuation zone when I woke up to warnings on my phone uh, you know, in the wine country at the Kincaid fire broke out and I was in a hotel in North Healdsburg. So it's very real, um, the, these um, emergencies. And the wildfires and damage from that and economic costs are part of what's in here. So it's, it talks about and has very clear indications of global human activity changes and then the climactic response. So essentially, what are the climate impacts that are at least linked in part to human activities related to that? So it shows in very dramatic and very clear ways um, what our situation is, and so it may be helpful in educating others uh, going forward. Thank you. Oh, Would you it is, mind providing the link or something? Yeah, yeah I can, I can send a link time. into yeah. um, the That'd clerk. That'd be great. Um, and uh, the, the article is in Bioscience, November 5th, uh, just last week, uh, World Scientists' Warning of a Climate Emergency over 11,000 scientists in 153 countries, which is most of them, uh, all signed on to this. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, we have some questions. If oh, you sure, could I'm sorry. Just, it's all right. I, I was just going to take note that there was a particularly distressing article on, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, that talked about the ice melts in uh, northern Japan and how it's changing the temperature of the water and the um, entire biology of the entire northern Pacific. It was extraordinarily distressing article. It, yeah, there's it, just an ongoing series of these things. One of the reasons I wanted to mention this one in particular is that it's, it's meant to be a very clear and very simple set of indicators that more people can easily understand. Um, so it's, I think, can be very useful as we go forward and we need more people to be doing things that they're not comfortable with. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public wishing to speak on a non-agendized item? If not, we'll move on to the consent calendar. Um, are there any members uh, wishing, directors wishing to pull an item from the consent or comment? And if not, I will entertain a motion to pass. I move uh, consent calendar <coughs> items 1A through 1I. I second it. Uh, so thank you. Uh, a motion by, uh, these mics are really hot tonight. <laughs> a motion by member, uh, Director Gibbons, second by Director Bruins. Any other discussion? 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We move on to the regular calendar. And before we start the items, um, there I have a request. If we could move item eight up to uh, after item four. Um, are there any, anyone? Everyone okay with that? Great. Thank you. Then we will now move on to the items. Item two is our CEO report. Uh, welcome, Mr. Balachandran. Thank you, Chair Abikoga and members of the board. Uh, in addition to my written report to the board, I'd like to bring your attention to a couple of things. Uh, one, we've signed a contract with uh, Mr. Bruce Carney uh, to help us with a project. And essentially, it's to study ways in which SVC could work with local high schools to provide training on civic engagement. The goal of this training would be to give high school students the knowledge and skills to effectively engage with local cities and other public agencies on issues they deeply care about with an emphasis on environmental sustainability. Uh, Bruce will be presenting his analysis and recommendations to SVC by the end of the year. Uh, I wanted to call your attention to that because that shows up in my CEO report and he will likely be uh, reaching out to one or more of you as elected officials, you would have some very useful feedback on how we can get our young citizens to engage effectively with elected officials such as yourself. So Bruce will be reaching out to a few of you, uh, assistants of this project. Uh, so that's one update. Is there a question on that? Um, <clears throat> Okay. And then just as a note. Sorry, I guess we have some <laughs> questions. <laughs> so um, actually, I had um, Director Smith and then Dr. Okay. Ellenberg. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's great to hear. And I hope that Bruce reaches out to me. I'm, I co sponsor a youth group that's working on various issues, one of which is uh, climate action and climate change. And I know that um, Cupertino has one as well. So. Um, a youth group so thanks thanks for doing that that sounds great and I wanted to make a, a very similar offer I'm part of the democracy in action with the County Office of Education mm -hmm. and have uh, have taught civic engagement to middle school students and I oh. would love to be a part of that fantastic thank you so much for offering well, I'll just I'll add that I spend time probably twice a year at San Jose State and also in high schools so would love to uh, collaborate and share what I found to work on this. Thanks. And I, since everyone oh. is talking, I'll talk. So, do it uh, so Campbell Union High School District has a, uh, particularly at Prospect High School, has a very active civic um, cl class in civics. And in Campbell, we have 30 to 50 students at almost every single council meeting. And it's clear um, they're lost. So if you need some group that needs help, we volunteer. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, Los Santos. And I'll make <laughs> just a go comment. down all the cities. We haven't even agendized the REACH codes yet, and we've had at least a half a dozen Los Altos High School mm -hmm. students coming and talking very eloquently on the subject matter. I can't imagine how many are going to show up when we actually have it on the agenda next week. And I was going to cool. add that um, I spoke to a second grade class today, and <laughs> <laughs> I was really, I couldn't believe it. They taught me all about GHG gases. So um, <laughs> I, don't, I, I know it's high school, but it's something to think about, you know, and to, to really get to the, the young folks. And um, yeah, I'll share my, my email exchange with an adult that I had later, or later on, but um, I think that's really great. So thank you. <laughs> All right, anyone else want to share? If not, we'll go back to you. I already spend way too much time around children. I'm happy to see other people take this on. I guess we're all in favor of that decision that oh, you made. I'm sorry, one more comment here. Yeah, so one more comment is that um, I did email an offer from an agency statewide that was offering um, time of use programs for elementary students to our board oh. members, so oh, I'm hoping nice. that uh, we can reach out to them and teach kids about time of use and hmm. how with the renewable and solar energy, when you do things matters. Okay. 
So I'd also like to call your attention to our community benefit summary. Uh, and we plan on sell, sending this to a number of our stakeholders and, of course, sending it to all our city council members on all our city agencies and all our city managers, too. So that will get sent out shortly. Uh, with that, I would like to ask Hillary Staver to come up and give you an update on legislative and regulatory affairs. <clears throat> Good evening, directors. So as usual, you have your, uh, your monthly update in the packet there. And tonight, I wanted to highlight one thing in particular, which is in the, which is in the integrated resource planning proceeding. Um, as of Thursday, we have acquired a new procurement requirement for capacity on top of our usual requirements in the resource adequacy proceeding. And resource adequacy um, has come up in meetings before here. You're probably familiar at this point. That's how we ensure grid reliability in the state of California. <coughs> but we had some overlap uh, starting earlier this summer with some findings that came out of the first uh, integrated resource planning cycle. So I'll give a very quick summary of that, just since we finally arrived at the end point where we actually do have a new compliance requirement. Um, so, basically what has happened is, you know, the CPUC and the California Independent System Operator, uh, they are in charge of grid reliability, but separately in the state, uh, we've been working on retiring once through cooling plants for reasons of their impacts on the local environment. And so, there's a large tranche of those plants that was due to be retired at the end of 2020, and in around June this year, uh, there was sort of a collective realization at the CPUC that we were going to lose plants that were really important for state reliability and that there hadn't really been a plan for replacing those. So we've now been working on this for about the past six months. Um, we had a proposed decision in September, a bunch of revisions on that, and basically what that has come to is there's now 300 or 3,300 megawatts of capacity that all load serving entities across the state are going to collectively procure. So our share of that is 67.2 megawatts. We have to bring that on board by 2023 with some interim milestones along the way. And uh, the CPUC is also recommending extensions of one to three years on OTC plants at four different locations in Southern California as an interim measure to try and give more time for the rest of the grid to uh, not only come up with replacements from a reliability standpoint, but hopefully cleaner replacements um, though, so we can reduce our reliance on gas as a system. So in terms of how we're going to meet those, a um, couple things to note. So some of the projects that we're working on may actually be able to count towards this. We're waiting, we'll hear in early December from the CPUC what their final baseline list is that they're including in, that they're counting as already, already counted. Um, so it takes a while to bring things online, and some of our older projects may actually count as incremental for this. We're also looking at doing some joint procurement with a couple other CCAs, as we've done before, um, to try and tackle some bigger projects potentially. And, uh, and we, will, we need to inform the CPUC by mid-February of whether we would like to self-procure. So that is our plan for now, but that they set it up as usual, giving CCAs the opportunity to self-procure if they would like, and then there will be a and on behalf of option um, if any CCAs choose not to. So all of which is to say you may see some contracts um, for additional capacity resources beyond our usual requirement coming up uh, in the next few months here. So that's IRP. Um, that is the tail end of the last IRP cycle. We are, of course, continuing work on the 2020 IRP. And um, on the legislative side, I'll keep that brief tonight because you're going to hear more about that uh, from our legislative ad hoc committee report. Any questions or comments? Yes. Um, so, so can you say more about what's new about this capacity thing? We get RA and all. It does, is capacity the ability to generate a certain amount at any time of day or night, or what exactly is it? Is it to make sure that there's not too much residual required or what, what, what's behind this? The idea behind capacity is 
and the idea behind sort of having contracts for capacity specifically is to ensure that not only do we have enough energy on an annual basis, but that in the peak hours where we have the highest simultaneous demand, um, we have enough power being generated on the system to serve the entire load. So it is based on time of day. It is, and measured how how granularly? Well. Oh man, we could talk about this the whole evening. In short, um, okay. historically, there has not been a time associated with capacity. A megawatt was a megawatt, and when, and when most of your system is gas, you don't need to associate a time because you can ramp a gas plant up anytime you need it, yeah. 3 a.m., 2 p.m. Um, increasingly, as we move towards a less, uh, less gas-based system, we have resources that can provide capacity in some hours and not in others. So we're at, the CPUC is actually um, just this, also at that same voting meeting on Thursday, opened a new proceeding <coughs> looking into restructuring the RA process entirely because mm -hmm. we may now need to start specifying times on our capacity. So this could be dispatchable capacity or something that qualifies it, either in time or in terms of ability of the ISO to turn it on and off and so forth. There was actually, there was a, a speaker at the Cal CCA conference last week that I think summarized it succinctly when she said that um, historically one megawatt of capacity in contracting has reliably been able to equal one megawatt of capacity in the market, but increasingly as you have more of these non-dispatchable variable renewable resources, right. that's no longer the default case. You have sort of more restrictions on when that capacity is available. Thanks. I'm sure we'll hear more about this in our committees and things. Come ask me questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call up Amy Bailey, our Director of Decarbonization and Grid Innovation, uh, to give the board a quick update on the RFP that we issued jointly last year, last week, on resiliency. Uh, good evening, directors. So this will be a, um, a brief update, but definitely wanted to provide a few highlights about the uh, announcement last week. Um, we joined forces with two other CCAs and a municipal utility to release uh, this RFP to help support resilience within our community in response to um, the PSPS events, the public safety power shutoff events. And specifically with East Bay community uh, energy, Peninsula Clean Energy, and then Silicon Valley Power. And actually, we were discussing this might be the first CCA municipal utility RFP, at least that we're aware of. Um, so that's in itself is kind of a big deal. Uh, this RFP is an RFP specifically for resource uh, adequacy from behind the meter storage systems. And we're looking to partner with different storage developers to deploy these systems in our communities where um, residents and businesses uh, want that additional backup power. And so those storage systems will provide backup power during times when the grid is shut down. Um, but then the second value stream, when the grid is operational, we can call on those for resource adequacy um, as well. So we're, we're, that's the actual form of the contract um, with, with the developer. So for the RFP, um, in total, uh, across the four different entities, we're seeking over 30 megawatts of resource adequacy. Our target is 10 megawatts. Depending on the price, um, we could procure more or less. Uh, we're targeting also half of that to be from residential uh, systems and customers. And you know, it really depends on what sort of proposals we get in, but this could probably translate to a couple thousand homes and uh, uh, dozens of businesses um, uh, getting uh, storage. Um, so for the timeline for that, the RFP was uh, released you know, recently last week. Um, we are seeking proposals by December, uh, right before Christmas time. We'll be evaluating those proposals and selecting finalists, entering into contract negotiations. We're hoping to bring some proposals, some contracts to you all uh, in the spring uh, for your review. Uh, and then any, the programs resulting from this RFP would then be, uh, the details would be announced thereafter and the programs launched thereafter. So that's kind of the brief um, timeline. Happy to answer any questions you may have. That's Director Corgan. Hey, thank you for that. Um, I'm missing something. How, how do you transmit when, when PG&E's turned everything off? 
Yeah, so this, the systems are providing two different value streams. One is resiliency to the customers when the grid is shut off, um, so they, are, they can provide backup power. So we specifically incorporated a requirement such that those systems need to be able to island. Um, and that's what our customers are, are looking for. That's what people are asking for, of course, so they can weather, the, uh, weather those events. However, during normal grid conditions, um, we can call on uh, those for resource adequacy. So you're exactly right. They're kind of two separate value streams, but a single system can provide both, one to the customer resilience, uh, and then one would be to us. And effectively, by monetizing that resource adequacy, we're kind of buying down the cost of the system uh, mm. to the customer to make it more affordable for them. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry. Mr. Ellenberg. Thank you. Um, are we targeting, or would this process, once it starts happening, target particularly low-income yes. families? Will that be part of the strategy? Yeah, so in the RFP, we ask uh, specifically for suggestions on how to target low-income, disadvantaged communities, um, other hard-to-reach customers. And so we'll be seeking proposals from them. I mean, these, these, the, the folks that we'll be getting proposals um, from, they're the ones that are really, uh, you know, at customers' doors uh, selling these systems and have a lot of knowledge on, on the market. And so we're expecting um, uh, a lot of insight on how they think we can best serve these customers. Uh, and in addition to that, through the proposal process, we're asking for them to propose a go-to-market plan that leverages SVCE's uh, specific marketing assets and I, hopefully as well our member agency marketing assets. And, and certainly um, those are target groups uh, for this RFP. And so we'll be getting proposals from them, um, having a lot of internal discussions on how we think we can best uh, reach these different customer groups. And all of that would be incorporated into the go-to-market plan for when the program launches. And so if, um, if anyone would like to speak further or have further questions about this, we'd love to have discussions. I mean, given the timeline, we have uh, some lead time to kind of think through a lot of, um, uh, a lot of this and would love to have discussions with you all on how we might be able to work together. Great. As the process moves forward and we know who the vendors that we're going to be working with, I would be interested in seeing how the county can be helpful or useful to this, to this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, that's Thank the you. end of my report. Any other questions for our CEO? Um, I'll open this up then to the public. Any members of the public? Yes, please come on up. You can fill out the card after. <laughs> well, it's very exciting to hear the enthusiasm you all have for involving youth in uh, civic <laughs> affairs. Uh, and I am aware of the YAPA is that the right acronym that you participated in last weekend in Campbell? Yeah, YAPEA is um, the Cupertino one. YPPI is the Sunnyvale one. Oh my goodness, that was not on my so radar it's screen. The youth public. The Sunnyvale and yeah, yeah uh, youth public policy institute is um, the other one. Okay. So basically, the idea is you know to build on the enthusiasm we've seen through the youth climate strikes and other action. Uh, to help direct uh, all that passion toward the processes that actually move public policy. And this project will be moving forward at uh, internet speed. And so I will assume that unless you opt out, you would like to be uh, informed of how it's going forward. And actually, I intend to get a first draft straw man proposal out on Friday. So your weekend can be spent correcting my work. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm sorry, Director Smith. Did you have a question for Mr. Carney? Um, I did kind of. So, um, what kinds of things are you proposing? If, can you give us a little preview? Or? Sure, very brief preview. Um, rather than being offered at a particular high school, it would be offered city by city. So for example, in Sunnyvale, or what, five or six different high schools, both public, private, continuation, same in Mountain View. Uh, some small cities that don't have a high school within the, the city boundaries, but send their students to 
from Monte Sereno to Los Gatos would probably be merged. And the idea is that a, there would be a two-person a two teaching team, one of either a current or retired high school teacher, of government or civic affairs, and a current or retired elected official. And so between the two of them, they would uh, have the class management skills and the content knowledge to follow a curriculum that would be developed and instruct the students. There would also be a substantial online portion. Uh, the idea is that the training would be sort of like karate, where you have a white belt and then another belt and then a black belt, so that students could go as far as they wanted. So if you just wanted a taste, you could stop after a taste. If you wanted to go farther and farther, you could do that. Um, there are several programs uh, that look somewhat like the program that I'm envisioning but none that exactly overlap it, and none that seem to be intended to scale to hundreds of students per year. So I'm gonna give you a, re a recommendation. Um, um, what, what comes to my mind when you talk about the leveling is a um, platform called LRNG, which is intended, it's learning without the vowels um, and it gamifies learning and also uh, focuses on getting students um, paired up with adults and out in the community and they earn badges and experience points and it's sort of a way to get um, kids uh, connected with careers. And so um, it's available for the groups that sign up to it, it's available nationwide. So if we developed a curriculum here or you adapted some of the the learning uh, online modules for this sort of thing it could be available nationwide okay so and LR, it would be L, just Google. lrng yeah you can search on it um and our I, I think various libraries around uh, have it um various nonprofits have it and it's intended to help uh, more disadvantaged students um overcome kind of the gaps for um extracurricular activities so it's really um, targeted at lower income or at-risk students so and it certainly doesn't exclude other people um, so Nova has used it so the workforce board has used it for their youth program and I know Sunnyvale library was looking at doing it for um, students around the around Sunnyvale but it's a very um, very engaging way to get um, to get curriculum to students, uh, which may be an interesting way uh, to go. The memberships aren't that much, so SVCE could, or Cal CCA, or you know some group that's that's related, um, could actually get a license for not a whole lot of money and develop curriculum, and then it would. It's something to look at in your proposal, so before okay. you finalize it, maybe take a look. And Thank you for the lead. Sure. And then Director Sinks. Since we have you at the microphone, and this is, this is all there is in the CEO report, I think there must be some exciting news that's come out of some of our cities about reach codes adopted. I read a little something about Mountain View uh, this week. You're is, would it be appropriate ending. to... <laughs> Would it be appropriate to, to You're report? You're spoiling the ending. <laughs> ending of what? Is it we on the agenda? Yes. We have, we have, yes. We're it's at jumping. the very end. Oh, fine. We're jumping ahead. It's in there. It's in there. You know we're going to do our little round. Okay. At the end. Okay. Fine. Oh, at the end. okay. Yes. Let, let me do our reports. Fine. I stand down. Oh, All right. Anyone, anything else for Mr. Party? No? Right. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to your... Uh, well. Proposal, well, and we have Mr. Tillay. Hi, uh, James Tillay again, resident of Sunnyvale. Um, I wanted to applaud the effort of SVCE and, the, and its partners um, for the resolution of uh, the um, resiliency initiative. Uh, I think it's a critical thing, and we're all realizing that we're behind the curve on being ready for these sorts of things that are impacts of climate change. Ultimately, um, I did want to make the connection also with the reach codes um, and what we're hearing is some objections are, you know, emotions are raw this is a tough challenge people have their power cut off for days on a time but it's coming up in multiple cities across San Mateo in this county that oh well we need to keep the gas because it's better for resiliency well 
My overarching comment is that it, the reason that the power was shut off was because of um, climate change in, induced uh, or increase of wildfire risk that makes them um, stronger and worse. And so we're going to keep or you want to keep part of what is actually causing that problem, the nat fossil fuel natural gas. Um, that's an overarching comment. It's, it's the wrong answer um, and it's perpetuating the problem. Um, also, I wanted to point out that the most resilient solution is all electric solar and storage. And a key thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the resistance is coming from folks that don't want change in their existing buildings, but REACH codes is about new buildings for the most part. And so new buildings is all about planning ahead to solve the problem that caused this in the first place. So it's not existing buildings, no one's taking away people's gas. I wouldn't advise that they light their stoves when the power's off because then their exhaust fan doesn't work and the pollutants are even worse. So there's lots of reasons why gas is not the right choice, but in both all electric and in all gas, you can have a propane stove on your back patio. Uh, and, and so, thank you. We have a question, is it? Uh, not a question, oh. as much as just a quick comment oh. that um, in a tongue-in-cheek exchange that's gone back and forth with the city manager in Los Altos Hills and myself, um, he, is, he was saying that when his power had been cut off, at least he still had his gas. One of the KB, KCBS reports I heard on the radio said that one of the reasons it had taken so long to get power returned to so many homes up uh, north was because they had to go and light each pilot with a certified engineer to do it. Um, so the, the pluses and minuses um, need to be carefully considered. I think there's a lot more to it. Yes, Director Beltran. There we go. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank you for your comment. Uh, I, we certainly, we just passed the ban for natural gas and new construction in Morgan Hill and there was lots of, I'm very proud to say that, that we were able to support that. Um, and there, there was definitely a lot of pushback and, and much of it came to this point. But again, I do, I do wanna reinforce that as we've heard, gas was one of the problems that attributed to the power being shut off for so long. And I think you're exactly right. There's a lot of, there is some misinformation. I won't say a lot, but there is some misinformation that does include existing buildings. Um, we're not there yet. I think we're getting there. But again, just to reinforce that because this is for new, this is the low hanging fruit. I mean, I was in New York seven years ago. They were doing this then. And so I just hope and encourage people to understand we're we're already behind the curve yeah. and you know I know that it feels like like we're pushing and we're grabbing but we really are behind the curve so um, I think one of the challenges for us will be exactly what director Ellenberg had spoke about earlier is making sure that we're including low-income households and how we fold that in as we include <coughs> this in in the new development yeah so. that's very important and, and New buildings <coughs> is the easy stuff. Right. Uh, and yeah. that's also what helps make existing buildings and retrofits easier later because just as with any other new technology goes into new buildings and new homes, that's what sets the stage and gets the market ready for change in the existing buildings. Existing buildings is the hard nut to crack. Doing the reach codes has so many benefits for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is this a comment? If the, the, we're actually finishing up, or did you have a comment on the CEO's report? Or okay, <laughs> I kind of lost track of where we were on the, on the agenda. So we were at the CEO report. I, that concludes it. Um, so we will move on to item, and they, we can have comments later. I know there's a lot of um, lots of uh, folks who want to speak on share. So we'll do that at the end. So item three is the um, information related to the 2020 SVCE board elections. And we have An Andrea Pisano, our board clerk. Yes, thank you, thank Chair. You. Good evening, directors of the board. Andrea Pisano, board clerk. This item is regarding our 2020 SVCE board election process and timing, which is similar to last year. In our operating rules and regulations, it states that our chair, Vice Chair and Executive Committee shall be appointed at our annual meeting in January, which in 2020, that will be January 8th. 
and all remaining committees will be appointed at our February meeting, which is February 12th, 2020. So for those who are interested in serving as our chair or vice chair for 2020, if you could please submit a letter of interest to me by December 19th, that will allow us time to include those in our packet for January's meeting. Similarly, if you're interested in our executive committee, and just a reminder that that is a committee that is made up of five of our directors who discuss policy um, and make decisions on that, or not make decisions, but um, make suggestions to the board. Um, if you're interested in serving or continuing to serve on that body, if you could please also let me know by December 19th, that way I can include in the staff report who is interested and we can make a vote on that on January 8th. Our remaining committees uh, will be assigned in February, so shortly after the January board meeting, I'll be sending out a matrix. A draft of that matrix is included in your packets this evening as attachment two. Uh, this matrix includes a list of our committees, a description of them, uh, membership, as well as the frequency of these committees. And if you could please return those to me January 31st for inclusion in our February board meeting packet, um, that would be helpful. So in summary, if you're interested in chair, vice chair, or executive committee, please let me know by December 19th. And additional committees um, following the distribution of the matrix in mid-January by January 31st, that would be great. Uh, this is not the last time you'll hear this information. We'll have another verbal reminder next month, and I'll be sending out an email as well uh, with these deadlines and requests. So with that, if you have any questions about timing or process, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. Any questions from directors on our elections? No. Yes. Yeah, this is, a, this is the same process that we did yes. last year. So yes. it seemed to work okay and we, yes. we're continuing it. Yes, so we'll take um, letters of interest and then at the January board meeting have an election out of, out of the, and we, we still can, I believe, take Interest, nominations from yes, the floor. Yes, correct. Nominations correct. from the floor as well. Yes. So, um, and the other item I wanted to bring up um, for probably for future further discussion is that um, some of our current board members will be um, departing in the next year or two. And um, so we, we're, we've been talking about, and we've talked about this with the CEO as a goal as how do we plan succession plan? Um, how do each of us think about um, who will be succeeding us down the road? Um, and one I, um, I idea or suggestion that's come up is maybe we look at um, whether we can have our board uh, positions here be longer terms than one year. And if, um, let's say if it's a two-year term, and you know, BTA does that, other agencies do that. So that might be something that we might, may want to look at as uh, SVCE board as well. So I'll just put that out. Any other questions? I'm going to open it up to the public. Any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? No? And we'll bring it back. And there's no vote on this item. So we will move on to, thank you, Andrea. We go on to item four, the utility restructuring in Northern California. We're back to our CEO. Are you ready for the yes, I utility? Am. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about succession planning. Right, right, right. <laughs> Too fast. <laughs> no, no, we already, you're our second, and you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Board members, not staff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, item four, um, I don't have a presentation, but all of you are aware of news articles recently uh, related to the future of PG&E. Um, we've had Governor Newsom uh, speak about maybe having a, plan, uh, having a plan B, which would involve a state, state takeover of PG&E if they don't emerge from bankruptcy effectively. Um, we have Mayor Licardo having uh, got a joint letter signed by many mayors across Northern California talking about a co-op model. Uh, several of you, actually seven board members and three alternates have supported that letter and there will be an additional letter in the <coughs> next few weeks which brings 
many more city council members around Northern California who are interested in this idea uh, to have their voices heard. Uh, earlier today, Senator Wiener talked about legislation that he plans to introduce that would make PG&E a publicly owned utility. So when I think about this idea, um, try not to get hung up with the name of a co-op and what's a co-op, but think more about the principles that we in representing the customers would like to see in a PG&E that emerges from bankruptcy. We all know that PG&E is going to have to spend billions of dollars in hardening the system to prevent these wildfire damages from happening. So their cost of capital is very high. A public agency would basically have a very low cost of capital. So that would be one of the principles we look for in any kind of model which we want low cost of capital. The next is the profit motive. Every dollar that is spent by a private utility like PG&E, there is profit baked into that. Whereas as a public agency, if a public agency runs a system, there is no profit. Everything gets reinvested back into the system. More transparency. Uh, we all know as public agencies, we run our meetings in public. Essentially, there would be more transparency around governance and operations. Having the voice of the customer heard more in PG&E's strategic planning and operations. And also, uh, making sure that worker rights are preserved moving forward. So those are the general principles we would want to support, and I think the co-op idea as being proposed would support many of, many of these principles. Uh, I am talking to some other CCAs, including San Jose and East Bay and some other CCAs, uh, looking to hire Mr. Dan Richard, uh, who used to work for PG&E at one time, and he was in the BART Board of Directors and then the Chair of High Speed Rail. So he has a small group of people who have, has come up with this idea and is moving it forward. And uh, I'm in the process of working with other CCAs to contract with him uh, at an amount below the authority that you delegated to me. Uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, open it up for discussion, answer any questions that you may have, and also get a general uh, sense of direction and support over moving this idea forward. We are quite late in the game to bring such a big idea forward, but things have changed recently. I think when the PSPS uh, events were initiated, uh, that changed the entire landscape of our business. Uh, just the rhetoric from Governor Newsom from 30 days ago to today is quite different. People are more open to this idea and we may never have an opportunity like this maybe until the next bankruptcy. So um, I'd like to hear your comments. I'd like to answer the comments, the questions that I can. Remember that this, this is just in the idea phase right now. We'd like to get this idea uh, heard at the highest levels of our state government, at the governor's office, and at the CPUC. So with that, I'll look okay, it up. Thank you. So uh, Vice Chair. Sure, I'll try to be quick, because I'm sure everybody wants to weigh in in the same ways, hopefully. But first off, you know, PG&E becoming the same utility that they've become already before clearly doesn't seem like it's a path to success. And we may be late in making a proposal. Uh, I still think fundamentally something has to change if we're going to get different results. So I don't mind that it's late. The only comment I have, and it's probably an unanswerable question at this point, in all of these models, there is some governance structure. And in those governance structures, I am assuming, and it may be incorrect, that it's, that it's either going to be geography-based or it's going to be load-based. But do we know kind of what our preferred governance structure would be? And will we have much say in that model? That's a 
great question. You're right that it's unanswerable at this time. I'd say, though, it is an extremely important uh, piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And I don't think the current models of, say, a municipal utility or even a municipal utility district would work mm -hmm. uh, for an agency of the size of the geography that we have in pg and &E. But California has done big things before. Uh, we created the California Independent System Operator, which has a five-member board of governors, uh, which the governor of the state has a say in actually nominating uh, these folks to uh, the board. And you have, I think, close to about two dozen different stakeholder groups that have input in who gets to be on that board. So I think this idea would balance out you know, things like workers having a voice, customers having a voice, but at the same time having uh, the technical expertise associated with uh, safety, uh, wildfires, capital investment for grid modernization. Uh, and we, I would think we really want to run it very efficiently, which would mean there would be delegation of powers, etc. Uh, so we try to keep politics to a minimum in running uh, an organization as large and complex as uh, pg and &E. uh, Director Ellenberg, and then I have Director Smith. Thank you. I was glad to sign the letter and certainly support the idea of public ownership. Just to clarify, though, the proposal or the initiative of Governor Newsom, that by Sam Licardo and other mayors and by the CCAs, are these competing ideas or are they variations on a theme? I don't want to see us get so bogged down in fighting each other that the that the existing giant wins by default. <laughs> yeah, right now, they seem to be almost done a little independently. They're not uh, competing against each other. Senator Wiener, in today's uh, announcement, he actually said uh, he does not, his idea is not meant to compete with the other ideas being put forth. So I think there's almost like a wellspring of response. People know they have to do something. And the default of having two hedge funds fight over pg and &E and one hedge fund coming out victorious, what happens to the rest of us? So I think that's what the reaction to that and the shutoffs. So I think these ideas are just coming up and there is a common theme to it, which is public power, some form of public power. So at this point, these ideas are not competing. I would say that the idea of municipalization which is being put forth by uh, the city of San Francisco is a different model than mm. the three that have been talked about, which is co-op, Senator Wiener's idea, or even Governor Newsom's thought he brought up, he's talked about a public benefit corporation uh, run similarly to the California Independent System Operator. So all those are basically all of pg and &E would get to be transformed to public power, whereas municipalization would be just a city. So that's a, maybe a little bit of a competing idea at this point in time. You mentioned wanting to keep politics out of this as much as possible. It sounds like that's already uh, the overlay to all of this, but I, I look forward to seeing that some of these ideas hopefully coalesce and uh, be able to present something that voters or stakeholders or however the decision is made can get behind. Thank you for this work. Great. Um, I have Director Smith, then Director Gibbons, Director Beltran, Director Sayok. So, Director Smith. Yeah, I'll, I'll just speak to the letter uh, that uh, Mayor Licardo put forward. I think that um, in general, I am supportive of proceeding with this path and would look to <coughs> Our histories of uh, various mi municipalities have successfully run municipal agencies, and so I do think there's some um, argument to be made for this being in the public interest to do it on a larger scale. And uh, evidently, my mayor agreed because my mayor, our mayor of Sunnyvale, Larry Klein, is one of the signatories on this letter. And it's also in looking at the signatories, uh, they 
they come from not only the Bay Area, but also Inland Empire, Northern California, and Southern California. So it's got broad support throughout the state, and uh, I do feel that it's worth at least considering as a due diligence, um, given the state, state we're in. So. Thank you, Director Gibbons. I just support the uh, comments that are being made. Thank you, Director Beltran. Thank you. Um, I see this as, as definitely an intersection for an opportunity, um, similar to where our CCAs were born. I think it's certainly a hard point, but as you said, I don't know when this opportunity would come again. I do, and so I, I really do support this effort, and, and I think it's important not to get caught into the details this early, that we should really allow the process to happen and the in interchange of ex ideas to happen and see where, where we can go from there. Um, I was very encouraged by, by the talk that we had at Cal CCA and spending time with other legislators and other municipalities who are thinking on this night, I think it really will take a group think um, to get to the right answer for us. But one thing I, I also have in my mind is, is talking about and looking at, we're talking about the energy side. And while I realize that the infrastructure would stay with PG&E, I, I have to admit that's a little bit worrisome for me because then we are, while we're able to secure the energy, we still are completely reliant on that infrastructure system. And so I would hope that there would be some discussion, some further discussion about that, um, looking at the challenges that we're facing now with housing and building out that infrastructure, such as piping for water, um, gas. These are huge expenses um, for different regions to have to take on. And so if we're looking at this at a state level, I would just I would just encourage us to maybe peel back that onion a bit as well. Thank you. Thank you, Director Sayahawk and then Director Bruins. Thank you. Um, Gersh, I just wanted to follow up on something <coughs> you had said with regard to the principles of, and that given how fast um, this is moving, I wanted to ask how you envision us having that discussion of regardless of which framework emerges, so what principles would we as a group all agree to so that you feel comfortable in your capacity working behind the scenes so that it doesn't get too political? Yeah, and I, I actually say to clarify, I think it has to be political first before it can become apolitical. This is a political move uh, because it's representing the people of Northern California. And so I think politics are necessary right now to get to a solution. It's the post when we, if and when we get a publicly owned organization, we want to remove politics from the running of that organization as much as we can. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, the state has carbon reduction policies and all that's politics. Uh, so I think in terms of uh, the key things for the benefit of our ratepayers uh, and moving here would be the low cost of capital, so access to tax exempt financing, removing the profit motive. I think that would change the culture of PG&E uh, to be more aligned with the needs of its customers, uh, and the low cost of capital would keep rates lower than what it would be. Uh, I think the other ones, including transparency, customer voice, worker rights, uh, I'd say all these are kind of co-equal, but the first two you know, really set us up for a lower cost future. Um, and a change in culture. And based on the discussions that you've been involved with, it's, it sounds like a lot of the, the various frameworks all have those encompassed, right? Uh, like, I don't hear one versus, I mean, the debt and the shareholders are separate, yeah. but the ones that are, that are emerging, whether it's Senator Wieners versus... Literally, these are names that are okay. being tossed up. So when people talk about co-op, you know, you go in and see how a co-op gets run. There are some pluses, but they're also co-ops get to uh, basically do a lot of political funding. 
that may not be what we want to have and have a big company like PG&E Co-op say, mm -hmm. you know, be able to provide money, put money into politics. So there's some of that. They're not as transparent as maybe a municipal utility, but they do have access to tax exempt financing. Uh, Senator Wiener has not provided any details. Okay. Uh, just talked about a publicly owned entity. Mm -hmm. The co-op idea has been talked about as a customer owned entity. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are with it. Okay, that. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director <coughs> Bruins and then <coughs> Director Alahi. Um, well, first of all, um, I'm glad that there is this activity going on and I'm delighted that our CEO is involved um, in this. Um, and I agree with a lot of the comments that are being made up here. You know, this is, you know, are we late to the table? I'm not convinced we are. Um, just because I think we're going to have to have a lot of this <coughs> heavy discussion so that the best ideas can bubble up. You know, the cost of not doing this is really too high. You know, because if you leave things the way they are in the status quo, it's going to be on one end of the spectrum. This might be a moonshot that's way too far, <coughs> but then again, Kennedy got what he wanted, right? Um, but you know, the, the worst case that can come out of this is something that moves us out of the, the worst case scenario. So, you know, th there's an upside no matter what we do. Um, and so, I definitely support um, and encourage this um, moving forward. And you know, the, the thing is, is there's a scary element of all of this in terms of, you know, the whole idea of making this a public en entity of some sort, whatever that might be is, you know, I think when you started off, you talked about the billions, billions of dollars that it's going to take to harden the system. And when you think about taking that burden and transferring it to the public domain is a scary thing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when you talk about those top two principles, it kind of helps. And I think, you know, we've got a lot of, it's our customers, it's all of PG&E's customers in terms of bringing, uh, bringing around that a whole idea and support for a change. Because it's too easy to kind of sit here and say, wait a minute, what is this going to mean? This is mean not only do I pay high prices for my energy, I'm also going to now be paying taxes or paying this or paying that for the, you know, the financing of this. So mm -hmm. I think there's some real positive things. Um, and I like the idea that there's a lot of ideas and I think we should not, we should keep going. We should not be <coughs> discouraged or hesitant because of other ideas. Um, we've got a lot of bright people that are on the team. Hey, Director Alahi and then Director Sinks. Uh, th thank you for bringing those ideas. I've been kind of mulling it over <clears throat> to see uh, what's doable and what's not doable. Uh, pg and &E is in bankruptcy right now. Uh, to buy pg and &E is effectively what we're talking about because somebody's going to have to buy them out. But if you can buy them through the bankruptcy, you might get a good price on it. <coughs> but uh, and then after you buy pg and &E, the question is the liability that's going to come in because of the uh, wiring system, trans uh, transmission systems that they have. The banks will protect us from existing liability because when they come out, they'll be clean. There'll be no liability except under the plan. But it's not going to pr pr protect us from any future liability that comes about. And the li there's also an additional liability. I don't know what their retirement liability is, whether their retirement is fully funded or underfunded, if that's billions or trillions of dollars. Uh, and also we have to look at uh, allocation. You know, the state has a lot of things on its plate. Our transportation system is totally messed up. Uh, the the light, lights don't work and we have cars stopped there because the signals aren't working. So if you take over PG&E, maybe the signals will, will be working, but the cars will still be parked out there because there's no room for them to move anywhere. So it's, so it's, a, it's a kind of allocation on what, uh, and the housing thing also has to be built up. So I think it'll take a lot of looking at it and see, you know, what, is, what do we prioritize? Do we prioritize taking over pg &E because right now we have a serious issue? Or do we look at what, what resources are available and hopefully we don't end up with, I, I, I think these ideas are going to be shuffled around, but I think whether we'll at the end of it be able to do it and so, you know, come up with a state-owned utility service or not, will really depend on what other priorities come up. Director Sinks? Yeah, so so I'm very much in support of this and wrote and, and I you know between different forms of governance, a co-op, a public utility, I don't know right what the right answer is, but I really appreciate Sam Licardo stepping up.
to speak out on this and, and take a lead. I appreciate all the mayors that have, have signed on. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's good to hear Gavin Newsom stand up. I mean, I recently read an article that he and his wife together had received some 700,000 in contributions from PG&E over time. And the truth is, they just spent a lot of money on politicians all around the state. That's a cost. All those television ads, why does a monopoly need to run television ads? One way or the other, you know, they can say it comes out of profits, but the, 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 the truth is, right, we are paying. If they have a PAC and their executives are funding the PAC, one way or the other, we're paying for all of this, right? And we, we talk about the profit component, but I think the story goes beyond that. Most companies have an incentive to contain costs, right? You make more money given a certain level of productivity if you can, if you can contain costs. For uh, any regulated monopoly, the incentive is just the opposite. If you can say, we need more money to run this business, and your return is set by the regulator at say 8% or whatever it is, you make a bigger absolute profit by convincing the regulator uh, that you just need more money to operate. So just imagine uh, the misalignment of interests between ratepayers and, um, and, and management here. Uh, you know, the truth is that uh, Every time they go in and ask the CPUC for something, they have a hundred times more resource to bamboozle them or capture them than the, than the staff of the CPUC does to you know, sort this all out and really figure out where all the money went. And so, you know, the other point I would make um, is ratepayers are on the hook for the downside. Right? Every time they enter bankruptcy or they threaten to enter bankruptcy and the legislature gives them a bailout, effectively what we're doing is giving the shareholders the upside while we're taking the risk at the downside. If you think about all of these things and you think about the fundamental inefficiency, particularly as this particular utility has been regulated by the CPUC over a number of years, it's no surprise that ratepayers in California municipal utilities are paying, paying on the order of 30 or 40 percent less than IOU customers in this state. And we all ought to think about that amount of money. Uh, so, you know, I, I think these are, these support the points uh, that you've made, Girish, and um, I think we ought to support labor. I think we ought to reach a, a fair settlement with the debtors and, and the insurance community. Um, we are going to need those folks going forward, but I'm not sure we need the shareholders, and I'm not sure we need the management that seems, it doesn't matter who the management team is, but it's just a, a misalignment of, of, uh, you know, uh, of interests. Um, so, yeah, I'm hoping that uh, the legislature and, and the judge evaluating this case will really be open-minded and entertain a different model. Because every time we bail them out and let them restart, um, you know, why would we expect a, a different outcome? So um, I, I'm very appreciative of uh, the leadership across the board on this and look forward to having a seat at the table. Great. Thank you. Any other uh, questions, comments from board members? If not, I will open this up to the public. I have uh, Mr. Talea. Hi, I don't always talk at every uh, agenda <laughs> item, but I, just for context, I worked at PG&E for eight years in energy efficiency, customer programs, and I did programs and regulatory affairs related to that. Um, I'm not going to, um, for my own public interest, not comment one way or the other, advocate one way or the other for decisions in this matter because my day job is uh, funded through PG&E as one of the customer programs that they run for residential. Um, so my, what I wanted to, to uh, get across is that as Mayor Licardo and the others involved in these early stages 
have emphasized that customer programs such as energy efficiency and demand response programs, low income programs like the Energy uh, Savings Assistance Program uh, will be or envisioned to be continued and not interrupted and I just favor that ongoing approach. Now, for, I have a, uh, a bias because I get paid through that, but um, generally um, all of PG&E's programs, their entire portfolio of energy efficiency programs, that's what I can speak to, is cost effective, meaning it returns more value to uh, the state and society in California than it costs. Um, each program may be higher or lower. I'm happy to say the Home Intel program that I'm involved in is one of the only two cost-effective residential programs. So, um, but overall, they're cost-effective. So um, just keep in mind customer programs that are paid for through public purpose program fees on everybody's bill should be continued, and, you know, transition plans. They're already at least 20% run by third-party companies and the CPUC a few years ago told them to told PG&E and the other utilities to make it make them run uh, over 60% of programs run by third parties like the way we run a program for PG&E. So they're already fairly independent and cost effective. So just keep those in mind to keep them in place. Thank you. Great, right, thank you. Any other members of the public wishing to speak? If not, um, yeah, I was uh, happy to sign on to the letter and I wanna thank um, our CEO for updating us. I, my question is, um, moving forward, will you just be reporting back to us uh, at meetings or um, yes. by c communication? Yeah, in on a regular all the appropriate basis? ways, you know, uh, CEO report, maybe a different, uh, a separate item in the agenda if there are any bankruptcy related issues that require closed session, uh, we'll do it in uh, multiple ways to keep you updated. Uh, if I may just add one thing, tomorrow yes. night I'll be speaking in, at the yes, right. Cities so, Association uh, board meeting mm -hmm. and talking about this issue. Uh, I'll be joined by Lori Mitchell, who's the CEO of the San Jose Clean Energy Unit, mm -hmm. and we'll be making a joint presentation to the Cities Association. Thank you, Rod, for arranging for us uh, to get some time there. Great. And uh, Director Corrigan? Uh, I just want to, it sounds like you have plenty of direction and uh, the comments of my fellow directors certainly mirror my own, so I feel comfortable that you've received enough direction to proceed. Um, I would like to go back to one of your um, first comments about <coughs> coming back with a letter that you hope uh, directors and city council members can sign on without just having to rely on one mayor from each of our representative cities. Um, I would like to ask that you get that letter out as soon as possible because smaller cities like my own uh, have a largely ceremonial meeting in December. So it may not be until January if we don't get it um, in our hands sooner than later. Uh, specifically, Los Altos Hills meets next Wednesday night. So if you can, in, by in any way, turn something around before next Wednesday, I would be happy to hand deliver it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will close this item and move on to item eight. We've moved up eight, our legislative ad hoc committee report by Director Sinks. Thank you very much. We uh, last met on the 22nd of October. <coughs> Uh, we reviewed the 2019 legislative session and began preparations and, and set some, talked about what may go on in the 2020 session. Um, so we looked at the fate of uh, bills in, in 2019, did a debrief uh, from the team in Sacramento. And I'd like to mention uh, that Aaron Reed was on the call. Earlier in this meeting, we uh, on consent passed renewal of Aaron Reed and Associates. It's been, I just want you to know that it's been most helpful to have uh, their direct and immediate engagement in Sacramento. Um, we are participating and, and getting great information um, in a very timely way, having engaged them. So um, I know that the ledge committee was uh, supportive of uh, continuing uh, uh, to retain them and I appreciate everybody uh, passing that tonight. Um, we know that the same kind of issues we were looking at this last year are gonna come back. Central procurement, 
direct access, these big uh, issues of fire prevention and mitigation, damage, cost recovery, and uh, the ongoing discussion of um, within uh, Cal CCA community, right? Uh, we see things a little differently and we all need to get together uh, to be effective in Sacramento. And, you know, I think um, I'm proud that SVCE has, uh, over time, increasingly taken more and more of a leadership position uh, in the advocacy and the negotiation between the, the CEOs that represent our, our members. We have a, a good voice at Cal CCA. I'm sorry I couldn't make the, uh, the meeting in Southern California, but it sounds like we had a few directors, so that's great. Um, so the ad hoc, uh, the ad hoc uh, committee also reviewed updates to our legislative platform and gave some feedback, and we'll be discussing that next. Um, finally, I'd like uh, to note that Steve Baker, who is uh, uh, Aaron Reed and Associates primary uh, person here helping us, will be present at our January board of directors meeting, and he'll provide an outlook for all of us in uh, public session for 2020, and that concludes my report. Great, thank you. Any questions from directors? If not, any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? If not, I'll bring it back, and this was a discussion item, so, and it actually segues right into our next item, item five, which is an approval of an update to the SVCE's legislative platform, and we have Hillary, Ms. Favor. Thank you. So, as you can see, this is uh, a highly expanded version. The last time that we looked at the legislative platform was in March of 2018. And this, uh, this review is something that we'd like to do annually going forward, but Specifically for this round, we felt it was important to expand it because the goal of the legislative platform is to provide a set of issues that the board can get behind so that we as staff have the ability to make decisions on bills, on amendments to bills in real time during the legislative session uh, so that we can participate effectively without having the board vote on every single position. So. With that being the purpose, then, it's important that the platform speaks to relevant and topical issues um, going into the 2020 session. And looking back at the March 2018 version, we felt that clearly the conversation in the state has evolved and there are a lot of things now that we are going to have to interact with in the next session that were just really not in the conversation at all a year and a half ago. So you'll see very little has been taken out. Um, but a lot has been added in, especially in the second section regarding sort of the broader regulatory framework because uh, as we just discussed at length, we do wanna be leading, not only engaging, but leading on some of these bigger picture issues during what is emerging as a pretty pivotal time for the energy landscape. So um, you can see, I think you have both the March and the uh, proposed updated version. Does anybody have questions or comments on that? Or maybe mm -hmm. I should let you prompt oh, that. Any questions for <laughs> Hillary? <laughs> nope. I think, are, did you have No oh, questions. Oh, okay. I think we're good. <laughs> um, or yes, well, I'm, I'm gonna give folks a chance to Look through it again. Um, yeah, let's go to the questions and then I'll open up to the public and bring it back. So, Member Smith, what did you say? Yeah, I'll just uh, state that the Ledge Action Committee got a chance to review that this uh, and give input. And um, happy to see it come forward from staff. And uh, thanks for the hard work mm -hmm. and carrying the torch forward, so to speak. I don't see any other directors, so I'll bring it, open it to the public. Any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? 
No? All right, I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, any other comments? Yes, uh, Director Bruins. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, <laughs> thank you. I mean, I really do commend the work, um, Hillary. I know it's predominantly your hand at this, but the entire staff. And I'll even give credit to our ledge um, ad hoc uh, committee. Um, this was fabulous. A fabulous document. I mean, it really has evolved it, and I, th I thought it was tremendous. So thank you guys. I'm ready to approve, make the motion to approve it. Second. Thank you. So there's a motion from uh, Director Bruins, second from Director Sinks. Any other comments? Yes, Vice Chair. Yeah, mine is not a comment on what we all hopefully love. You guys do a great mm -hmm. job. Um, in terms of, of rolling this out to the board, you said annually. What you probably want to do is have it revised at this time of year with an experienced board. And I think you want to bring it back in a February meeting when you've now seated all your new board members and review it as a discussion item. So it's probably has to, it best would probably be coming back twice. Once in the fall for updates and once in the spring just to bring all the new board members up to snuff. And if we see something at that time, the landscape's changed a little bit, it's a touch point for you to get additional direction. It's a good, great suggestion. Any other comments? If not, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, and thank you for your hard work on this. It is a really great document. Thank you, directors. So, all right, we are moving on to item six, our, the Customer Resource Center Program Update by uh, Director of Account Services and Community Relations, Don Bray, and Communications Manager, Pamela Leonard. All right, thank you, Chair, and uh, good evening, Directors. Um, tonight, we're gonna take you through uh, an update on where we are in development of our online Customer Resource Center. In uh, December and January, we're gonna br be bringing forward uh, some contracts. Uh, they'll probably be on consent, but they're going to be for various tools and content that we're gonna be developing as part of this. Uh, so tonight, we're just gonna talk through uh, a framework of what goes into this, uh, the various tools that we're looking to incorporate, uh, the what's and the why's and the wherefores and, uh, and the like. And Pam and I will uh, tag team this um, you may recall that the Customer Program Advisory Group last year uh, viewed providing uh, content and information on electrification as one of the, the top priorities for us to uh, incorporate into our program plan. Uh, so the program plan that was approved uh, in December of last year uh, had that uh, at or near the top of the list. Uh, we've been working hard on it uh, over the past uh, several months. We've been working on identifying uh, customer needs, thinking through what uh, um, uh, some of the, the tools and resources that we would want to provide uh, would be, uh, looking into the market and seeing what's available out there. Uh, we did a, an RFI uh, over the summer. Uh, we had eight or 10 responses to that. That informed the RFP that we did in September and October. We had 16 responses. So lots of interest in the market in, in providing uh, tools and, and resources for us. We're starting to, to shortlist that now, and again, we're gonna be bringing uh, the, uh, the winners forward in a, in a contract here pretty soon, or in a set of contracts. Uh, so our goal with the, um, with the Customer Resource Center is to have a mechanism whereby we can really engage our, our customers in uh, the, the journey of electrification. Uh, we do a lot of uh, tabling, uh, dozens of events a year. Uh, we do lots of uh, outreach, we have newsletters and so forth. And right now we have little to nothing in the way of, of uh, content or advice to share. Uh, one of the most common questions we get uh, when we table is, uh, hey, I'm thinking about solar, um, what should I do? And uh, sending them to Wikipedia just isn't really the right answer. <laughs> So uh, we, we, have to, we have to have better uh, content and, and tools than that. We get the same questions around EV. We're getting the same questions now around storage, as you might imagine. Uh, so we've got to really uh, up our game in this regard. Uh, we also have a lot to work with. We have 110,000 email addresses that are valid. 
So in addition to using this resource to, to take questions, we can be providing this content out into the community uh, in an outbound uh, way uh, through uh, this, this email channel and, and obviously um, keep reaching 250,000 customers uh, is something that we're going to have to use electronic tools to do um, because I think that's about uh, what 10,000 people per staff member uh, to address so that's going to be tough without this so in terms of of what we envision the, the customer resource center to do uh, we want to address some specific focus areas energy use and emissions uh, appliances, think uh, induction stoves, think heat pump water heaters, um, uh, electric heat pump space conditioners and the like, solar plus storage, EV, electric vehicle, charging infrastructure. Um, so those are the areas we intend to focus our, our content and tools in. And then we have to think about where customers are in their, in their journey. Some really don't know a whole lot about this other than that they care, uh, and they're really looking to be inspired. Um, and then others are inspired, um, but they want to be educated on, on what particular products might be best for them. Uh, once they've determined that, they want to, to buy these things and they want to get them installed. So how do we engage uh, as, as customers uh, with, uh, with the market in that respect? Right. Uh, so where we've been to date has been focused on the operational aspects of being a community choice energy agency and explaining how it works, focusing on the rates. And so we now have an opportunity with this customer resource center to engage all of our customers in the areas that they're interested in. And so for uh, over the course of several months last fall, we worked on customer surveys and developed this distribution of, you know, broadly speaking, this is of course um, a generalization and there's, there's overlap in, in some of these, but this is how we've really broken down the way that our customers' attitudes are around energy and climate change. And so, um, oh. Here we go. So starting out with this 10% uh, block, we've also given you a, about an approximate number of what this represents. So this represents about 25,000 residential customers. And this is looking just at residential right now. Uh, so you can see here a common question that someone who's already very informed about energy use, these are the folks that really look at their bills every month, the kind of question we might hear from them. Uh, next, we have the sustainably rooted. These are folks that are homeowners. They've been here for a while. They really care about the environment and really are interested in seeing what, what it is that they can do. And then we have our busy suburbans. I mean, this is a larger number here, and um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of news. It's hard to break through the clutter. Um, you're, you know, a million things going on. Um, so got to make it really easy and efficient, and especially here in Silicon Valley of all places. Uh, online access and uh, usability are very key for, for this audience. <laughs> the greens on the go, uh, this is really looking at uh, typically a younger demographic, renters tend to be more on the move, um, moving jobs. Um, we have a large you know, population of renters that do move in and out of our territory and they care and wanna do something but it is more difficult as a renter because you don't necessarily make those decisions for where you live. And then making ends meet. These are looking at uh, customers that are, are going to identify more as low income, harder to reach, underserved, um, potentially like also more renters or older, um, and you know have a lot of upgrade opportunities in their homes, but maybe don't know where to start, and maybe more price sensitive due to fixed income things like that. And then there's going to be the the percentage of customers who have opted out or are discovering us still and not not too happy. <laughs> um, so we do want to look at um, you know this this customer resource center as a tool that can serve all of these customer segments, and uh, looking at a couple of journeys here for uh, just as an example for some of these. Um, so again, the energy wonk they're more engaged. They know a lot about um, solar already. They already have their EV early adopter, um, especially in light of recent events. They're they're thinking about energy storage and battery storage. So uh, maybe they just really are thinking about it in that terms, but haven't thought about the resilience aspect or maybe how they could leverage time of use rates if they have battery storage. And so that's where we can give more ed educational content once we've captured them at that inspiration level. 
And then also enable action. So instead of sending them away to figure this out on their own or be confused by uh, contractors and different vendors, um, we could directly through this resource center um, involve them in getting quotes and also sign up for some of our own programs such as um, what we talked about earlier with our resilience RFP and having them right then and there going through our process potentially sign up for programs too. The Sustainably Rooted, just as another example, um, again, wants to do more for the environment. Um, the news around climate change can be quite daunting and depressing at times. Um, so again, the inspiration part of this is maybe they're thinking about shopping local or recycling, but not thinking about energy. So how do we capture them as understanding that the work we're doing around electrification and decarbonization can really give them hope about something they can do for the environment. Um, and of course, this is gonna then point them to resources to learn more about our tools and enable action to maybe do um, EV comparison shopping or shop for energy efficient products through um, with the appliances that we're offering. Okay, I'll quickly take you through the mechanics of, of how this is gonna be put together. Uh, at the top level, we're gonna make some changes to our website in terms of messaging and navigation. When you come to our website, it's gonna be a lot more about electrification and the resources that, uh, that SVCE can provide versus the traditional CCA messages around, uh, hey, sign up for green power and, and uh, you know, cheaper and, and cleaner. People know that we have a 97% subscription rate. This is an important uh, pivot for us. But one of the contracts we'll bring you will be for help specifically in, in messaging and navigation and some des design work uh, on our website. And this is really around the inspiration piece. You know, this is where people first land, uh, where we're looking to uh, inspire them and then help get them directed into uh, the area that they're interested in learning more about. In terms of uh, now subject matter areas on energy use, uh, education and, uh, and action, uh, informing people about uh, energy efficiency and emissions, providing some top level education, and then to the extent they want uh, more detailed information on, on things they can do, uh, there are tools out there that will uh, look at your energy use potentially gas and electricity, and make very specific recommendations for you. Tools that can help you optimize uh, the new time of use rates, for instance, um, that can provide alerts. I mean, they'll, it'll go this far if, if we want it to. Um, but there, there are some very interesting uh, products and tools in this, in this column. Around appliances, think uh, online store. Um, think a place you go to learn more about products uh, that are available, compare those products against one another, understand uh, pricing, available incentives, uh, rebates, discounts, uh, potentially provided by us. Um, we can promote through this type of a tool, uh, and then, of course, enable uh, purchase and, uh, and installation. All right, Don, uh, may I interrupt you? Take a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please. That's okay. Thank you. Um, if our sites are recommending particular vendors or products, um, I have a few questions about that. One, how do we decide? Do we vet who we're going to um, promote? Does that then um, create, uh, well, either liability or uh, essentially a stamp of approval? I love the idea. First of all, I love this whole thing. Um, I think it's really exciting. Um, and the notion of making it super easy, I may or may not be in that suburban busy category, just saying. <laughs> so going right from being inspired and educated to, oh, I can order this right now. Uh, but I do worry about how that selection will be made. Can you explain Yeah, that, a that's bit of that? a great question. Um, if we, see if I can go backwards here. Um, so looking at um, putting in place a marketplace, that would be with a third party that is really, in effect, running that marketplace. Uh, and then the, the products that are in there, we can say, we want to see um, LED products, we wanna see uh, um, induction cooking products, we wanna see uh, electric vehicle charging products, and they will populate the, the store with a wide range of, of products. And the, the recommendations are basically from the market. So they are they're market-based reviews um, that that in some cases come from 
you know, the Amazons and Best Buys of the world, that's where the data is pulled. And we're looking at a couple of different options here um, and haven't exactly decided on which one, but in both cases, the, the, the content that is uh, really informing the comparison is coming from the market you know, not specific, specifically from us. I can see a challenge either way. If we have a disclaimer that says we're not recommending any one of these products over the other, then that devalues our service because I would want to go to a site that has a good reputation that's actually in this business to make a recommendation. Um, but on the other hand, I think that that's, that's really risky for us to be recommending particular products over which we have no control. Right. Uh, so if there are reviews on it, like a Yelp or Amazon, that's okay. But I think there's still some work to be done here to really think through who gets onto our, our sites. Okay. Well, Chen. I, I really appreciate that point that Director Ellenberg is bringing up because it, it also is making me think about um, how do we determine which companies there are? I guess the question of equity, of, of you know, multiple players, and is there some type of a process or RFP that we go through even within certain products to decide who it is that we would be putting forward on, on the website? So, um, again, we're looking, we're looking at a couple of different um, tools in this space right now. Um, I think I mean the 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 available product suites are really broad, is all I can say, and in, in some cases about as broad as a, uh, an Amazon or a, a Best Buy might be. Um, you know, so there are lots of products to to choose from. Um, in another case, the the product set is a little more. It, there's still a lot of products out there, but the mm -hmm. product categories are far fewer. Mm -hmm. uh, so. There will be lots of, of choices, and again, the, the content on w w how products compare is its third-party content. Um, the, the purchasing is actually done through a third party. So when you put your credit card in, you're buying from this third-party supplier. Um, it's, it's not coming from directly from us uh, and, say, a warehouse that we own. Are there, so, I guess, for example, if you're if I'm on the SBCE website and I'm interested in putting solar panels, and I click on solar panels and I scroll through and I learn lots of information about what my steps might be to do that, are there then does it end at describing what solar panels, um, what options you might have, uh, how you might finance that, or do you then? Are there names, specific names that are given of companies and vendors? <laughs> so we're actually, again, we're looking at a, a couple of options here. One, one option is um, provides you with a, a high level assessment of uh, how good of a fit solar is for your home mm -hmm. and, and gives you some kind of rough economics. And then if you're interested in actually having a design done and getting three quotes from the market, mm -hmm. you provide information to this, this vendor who then effectively guides you through that process and gets quotes from vendors and presents those back to you. Uh, and then of course you can uh, elect to, uh, to take one of those if you want. Um, couple of different flavors of that with vendors that we're seeing, but that's the that's the basic process. So the idea is to try to help a customer understand um, the ins and outs of solar. Both the vendors that we're looking at have a lot in the way of informational videos and that sort of thing about different aspects of solar. So you can edu educate yourself. And then sure. if you want That's to get great. a specific um, um, set of proposals, you can do that. Is there any way we might be able to do an whoever the vendor is that would take these this these quotes that there would be an rfp for we're gonna send customers who inquire on solar for example um, we would then pr have three different vendors that we would provide quotes for or you know is there some way that 
the vendor that we select, there could be some parameters in that agreement between us and the vendor of how they would solicit those companies. Well, um, so these solutions already have a process for vetting and selecting local contractors. Um, so that's part of um, the solution that we're looking to contract with as a third party is that they already have this process for for selecting local vendors and we don't actually have to do that. We of course can influence and look at, <clears throat> you know, making sure they're, maybe we have our own set of criteria, um, but the idea is that that third party really manages the process and that from a customer experience standpoint, they're gonna get the information through our site, but it's a very clear handoff at some point in the process that you're now using vendor X or Z um, that is taking you through this process should you choose to um, get quotes from installers that are part of their network. Um, so that's the way that the, the solutions are structured from the providers that responded to the RFP that we did um, looking at what's available in the market. And um, we're going to share a case study in a little yeah, bit. From, I was going to ask yeah. you, I was looking ahead and there's a case study, so I'm wondering <laughs> yeah. if we should just move ahead okay, with the presentation. Okay, so maybe I can jump then, to the case study then. Okay. We can take more questions um, after. Yeah, that. and then yeah, the final thing was EVs and charging, so there you go. Um, so I'll kind of jump back and forth. but. SMUD, who's are you know on contract with us to support program administration, they've done this, and they're also a public agency. So some of these questions, they've they've been there, they have figured it out, and have been just raking in the awards ever since. They got Utility of the Year um, from the Smart Electric Power Alliance um, because of this. Um, so the idea is that we want to reduce friction. There are existing offerings by our, you know, IOU right now that uh, kind of offer um, a lot of things to customers, but aren't really targeted. You know, the marketing of those services as as well as we could do it, since we're closer to our community. And um, when you go to a store and you have a ton of options, or you go to Amazon and you type in LED light bulbs, how do you know which one to pick, right? So. Um, what SMUD has demonstrated when, when they launched their energy store in October 2017 is the ad increased adoption rate of the products that they're curating, so to speak, um, and offering to those customers. They're already that known trusted entity in the community and are helping to kind of declutter the hundreds of options for certain appliances and maybe they're offering eight types of smart thermostats. Um, the customer kind of trust in that, um, also able to apply instant rebates to that and not having to go through other barriers. We're really trying to, you know, there's, there's so much that we now have to get our customers to do to help us achieve our decarbonization goals. And however we can make that as easy as possible is what, why we're really interested in some of these solutions from these vendors that already have some of this curated um, solutions in place. Um, and, and just as a, you can see some of the very impressive stats here from SMUD, I mean 500,000 site visitors um, in a couple of years, 20% of which keep returning to buy products through them. Um, and granted they have 500,000 roughly customers, so uh, huge uptake. Um, they've, uh, yeah, it's been very impressive. The contractor referrals as well for installing some of these solutions is, is very high. And prior to launching the energy store, um, their traditional downstream rebate process for smart thermostats, in four months they moved uh, 1,600 rebates, which is where you have to like submit a receipt the traditional way, right? The instant rebates in that same four-month period, they did 5,000. So, um, so it's, we're really uh, fortunate to have an uh, experienced partner helping to advise us through this process, and we're leveraging a lot of the research. They have a whole market research division that we get to <laughs> leverage, um, and it's, it's been very insightful um, and helpful through this process. So kind of just also wanting to go back to this slide about driving interest and driving customers to utilize the Customer Resource Center. Um, is, yeah, we talked about our outbound marketing channels that we have already, but um, when it comes to utilizing partner outreach and a mass awareness and education opportunity, I just want to call out that as a member of the Building Decarbonization Coalition, and we've had Panama Bartholomew Barthol come and speak here, um, we've helped um, initiate a statewide education 
campaign for advertising on a mass scale, bringing awareness to the need for building electrification. And the timing for when they're looking to launch this is quite nice for our own timeline. There's definitely gonna be some overlap. And as they're driving statewide awareness around this need, we will have a place for customers to go. Um, and part of their campaign, which is also gonna be very high level, really, again, just bringing awareness to um, the dangers that we've all been aware of with natural gas and um, the needs that we have for electrification. They're also looking at influencing the influencers when it comes to contractors. So there's also um, this other part of the campaign that's gonna just really help get contractors on board with electrification too, which we know is a need that we have and are looking to address in other ways. Um, so there's a lot of movement right now, and so we're really looking forward to, to harnessing that as we go forward. Okay. And then um, just to wrap up, uh, we do have budget that was approved with the decarbonization roadmap for the uh, last fiscal year and this fiscal year. And then there will be um, additional marketing budget spends um, related to the statewide campaign, how we might support that, as well as launching our own um, product and then annual subscription costs that we will work into our annual budget. Uh, so just to close, uh, revisiting the, the timeline, again, we're evaluating RFPs uh, as we speak and really looking to narrow it down to what will probably be three or four solution providers we're working with, so three or four separate contracts, uh, and we'll uh, begin bringing you those uh, in December and really going to work on, on building this. Um, the target is to get um, some initial content at least launched uh, around Earth Day in April uh, and, um, and really get the, the full um, customer resource center in place probably in the summer time frame. Questions? Great. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, uh, Director Corgan, Director Lahey. So thank you so much. Um, let me start my comments by saying I have complete trust and faith in you guys to make sound decisions about this going forward, but I do have some questions and a couple concerns. Um, is SVCE going to monetize or, or earn money anywhere along this stream as a result of uh, making recommendations or referrals? Is there some methodology th that you envision here where we're actually commodifying commoditizing this um, pr process? So this is, this is an option that uh, a few of the vendors that uh, have proposed have, uh, have given us, and really it's our call. Um, we, can, we could conceivably make some margin out of selling product. We could conceivably make some margin out of uh, a contractor referral at the end of the day. I don't think that's the direction we want to go. Um, and you know that that's something that we would set up at the the time of the contract. Uh, I think it I mean, it's something we'll have to decide as a group. But I think our interest is going to be just having the the best possible price go to the customer. Yeah. So so my follow up or or second question would be uh, related to how your um, are there any metrics in place for for the referrals that would be available to customers. For instance, if I was uh, living in Los Altos Hills, am I gonna have access to vendors who are providing um, within our service area and also happen to be SVC customers, or am I gonna have access to vendors who might be in Fremont but willing to do the job for <coughs> slightly less? Uh, and, and those are really philosophical questions, not, not one that I expect an answer to, but sort of get to a broader, sort of complicated, uh, why this is sort of a complicated thing for me. Uh, and I'll just wrap up my comments by saying, um, as valuable as I think it is, and I love the numbers and, and being able to see what's going on, and, and again, I trust you guys to make the decision. You have a lot more information about it than I do. Uh, I see us as sort of in this rock, uh, rocky place where we really might be better off staying with sort of a consumer reports type um, a, a resource to our customer where we give them links to other ratings and 
and what other people have felt when they've adopted certain technologies or how they use them and found them to be effective, et cetera, versus links to actual products that's, that, that we may then have somebody calling us and saying, you know, that, that was terrible, it sucked, it, it burned down half my house, it whatever, nonsense, that may uh, put, us, put us in line for. So, I, again, I want to go back. I completely trust you guys make these decisions. These are just my initial concerns hearing about it going, hmm, wow, this is a very complicated uh, relationship we might be setting up with our consumers here. And I want to be very protective of the uh, consumers that we do have and make sure we're putting information at their fingertips that they want and use. I love the fact that it might actually help us reach our goals, but I'm concerned that we'd be... We're, we're straying from our, who we really are and becoming a retailer in some way. And I think that's my, that, that, that's the extent of my comments. All right, Mem, uh, Director Elahi, Vice Chair. Yeah, <coughs> thank you. <coughs> I, I, I think it's really good you guys are moving forward with at least establishing a customer center. I think we are at this stage are just discussing uh, that a website will be set up and these are the kind of things that the website will provide. As we explore it more and uh, once the website is in place, and I guess we're almost getting there, then we can look at uh, how the products are sold, if they're going to be sold or, or if they're going to be recommended. Uh, I mean, it's pretty easy that you know, if somebody clicks on the product that's being sold, they go to the different website and they know they're no longer in our Valley's website because we're finished with them at that point. We've already given them all the lessons, and when they click on a product, uh, it goes to another website, and, and what the Silicon Valley, what, what you guys would do basically is to make sure those products are, you know, decarbon products and greenhouse gas-free products, and you know, and basically eliminate everything else and just list about a, a thousand of those products. Whether we get any revenue or not out of it, I think we need to look at that to see if it's worth it because revenue and risks have to be weighed, and if the revenues outweigh the risk involved, because if a product is bad, the customer will go to the manufacturer, which is who they bought it from. If the installation services is bad, they'll again go to the contractor and hopefully the contractors we're retaining have been around for a while and have some kind of credibility and are bonded and have insurance so you guys have to review all that stuff. But I think this is going to provide a very, very valuable source because every day you think about, okay, I need to put an electric storage system in my house, what do I do? So you go to Google, you do a search and there's about 10 people who show up and then they all want your email address and then they want to call you about 10 times a day. And I, I'm still lost what to do about it. So, you know, going to Silicon Valley Clean Energy, I have, have a product, it might get done faster. So, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair and then Director Belcher. Yeah, Don, I think there might be a little tiny bit of confusion, and maybe you could clarify this point. You guys aren't going to have staff all go out and review 14 different electric cooktops so we can list them. What you're doing is you're getting companies that already do this stuff. And what we're gonna do is you'll go through our chains, but you're ultimately gonna end up with one of these other companies, not a list of toaster ovens on SVCE's website, right? Correct, yeah, oh. yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they'll come through our website, uh, but the purchase, uh, you know, the products are presented, the data about those products is curated by the third party, the purchase is done through the third party, shipped through the third party. Yeah, so it's really us sort of doing the tee up. And uh, Director we're, Alahi mentioned, yeah, we're, we're not going to be selling gas dryers on our website. Um, or even electric ones. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm hoping I can sell gas ones. <laughs> but, but just in general, the customer experience, we're like the clearing house. Yes. You know, you'll kind of go through a little bit of work and you'll say, it is really batteries that I want. And, and we will end up at, I hate to pick all the words wrong, but you know, Fred's excellent battery storage curator site. And this is somebody's site who's got customer reviews and some more technology primers and links to contractors in our area that are, that are supposed to know how to do this, right? They're not gonna get, it's not gonna be us that's giving that level of detail. We're gonna just get them set up and then we'll land them on a website that is somebody that's contracted with us that we know is providing good, relevant, current, curated, accurate information. Yeah. Yes. And if something gets off, we'll be pounding on those vendors to say, hey, your data is not helpful. So when they're calling about 
about their toaster oven not working in the bathtub, um, it won't be us. We'll be sending them to the vendors, right? Yeah, thank you. Great, uh, Director Beltran and Director Bruins. Thank you, Chair. I, I really appreciate all those comments and I think this is a fabulous idea. I think it's fantastic. I, I by no means want to dis detract from that. I guess my, my, one of my concerns is that as a public agency, um, we would be influencing businesses. So for example, as he's saying, you know, it would go to Fred's company. And I guess what I'm saying as a public agency, I would like to see maybe it's SMUD that would include um, perhaps women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, that there's some, there's some <coughs> discussion about that so that it goes not only to Fred, but that it goes to also Yvonne and that it goes to Shira or it goes to uh, Jose. And Fred, Fred's company was the clearing house. Yeah. Fred's okay. company wasn't the solar provider. Got that's it. what I'm saying. In all these areas, there's already a, a company that's done all the expertise and can point people to the final landing spot. Okay. So I just one more level we, in there. Yes. If we can just, that's really the only piece for me. I do worry a little bit about, um, I don't worry about it, but I think it's a decision that we need to consciously make whether or not we're obviously getting some kind of rebate from that. But I think we're in a perfect realm to make that. I don't really see anything with that. Uh, this would really just be that tiny, minute point. And, and again, I think it's fantastic. I think it's well thought out. I by no means mean to have any expertise in this. I just, that would be one point that I would just encourage. Thank you. Thank you, good point. Great, Director Bruins. Okay, a couple of comments here. Um, you know, I think if I were to try and sum up the comments that I'm hearing from my colleagues up here is, you know, I think as board members, our interest is probably, to I would sum it up as protect SVCE's reputation. Okay, and that's really what I think we're all trying to get to. And I think what you're hearing is, you know, some degree of nervousness because you can envision an implementation that we would all be appalled with. And I think you can also envision the implementation that says, this makes a heck of a lot of sense. Um, so, um, you know, I, I caution us in terms of making sure that whatever choices that, you know, you guys are going to be looking at and evaluating, you know, we, I don't want to see us um, perceived as endorsing any particular product. Um, and, I, you know, this whole clearinghouse concept is kind of, the, you know, obviously the better approach. Um, I want to make sure from a legal point of view that we also um, are protecting ourselves in terms of any opportunities for opening up liability with respect to vendors, installers, et cetera. You know, you think about pointing somebody to some place and then having somebody show up at your door and something, you know, going awry. Um, you know, so it's, you know, whatever the legalese, the disclaimers, et cetera, um, what we need to do to protect our reputation. So, so with that, um, one of the things I will ask is because of the level of nervousness up here. Is there an opportunity? Okay, I know you said you want to bring this to us with some contracts next month. I don't know what the sense of urgency is. Um, but is it possible, <coughs> if you're you know, moving forward with a couple of these, have you worked, can we, can we get, oh, I was gonna say, can we get a mock-up? Is there some way to get some sort of mock-up, even though, you know, maybe we need the thing to redo the website, but is there some way to kind of mock it up so that we as board members might be able to see here's what it, what we're talking about. You know, details might need to, are still to be worked out, but giving us some degree of confidence. Um, I'm gonna go and to then, the and then, wait, and the, uh -huh. Oh, wait. it sounds like Sia wants to answer that question, but. Okay, well, let me make my last yeah. comment, okay. then if you wanna respond to okay. the whole package deal. So again, you know, um, the other thing is I go back and maybe sometimes we're dating ourselves here, um, but, I, but I think I'm in good company here. <laughs> but you know, I mean, there was that whole time when you know you went and suddenly you were linking someplace, and the next thing you know, that link is broken, or that link has been redirected, and you suddenly end up at a porn site, as an example. Okay, so I want to make sure again, what we have is again protecting our reputation. There's, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can you know go on this. But trying to figure out what is that, what is, you know, what happens in some of these, you know, worst case type of scenarios. I think this is a great idea. I love this idea. I think with, I love, by the way, the way we characterize the market segments, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and which one are we in? But 
you know, I, I really see a need for this. I think there's a need to do it well and one that we all can be proud of and, and not tarnish our names. So if you want to comment on any of that, oh, wait, one last one, wait, 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 wait. On a totally different thing, the monitor, you know, I think we need to look very seriously at whether or not we have an asset that we want to monetize. So I know, you know, Don, you mentioned something like, well, do we want a cut of, you know, selling this induction range? I'm not so much interested in that. What is it that we're giving these clearinghouse? What is the advantage of partnering with us? It's our, it, you know, it's it's our reach into our client, our our client base, right? So, do is there an opportunity, and should we actually look at whether monetizing our asset? I I agree in terms of not wanting to take a cut of something that happened, okay? Um, but yeah, it's 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 it is monetizing our asset, which is that access to our um, customers. Mm. So I, I, I guess I would like to say, I think if we haven't looked at that, I would like to see us looking at whether we have an asset that makes sense for us to monetize, which is the access to our sure. customers. Okay. Thank you. Right, I'm going to go to our CEO and then we'll bring it back. So I'd like to address um, both Director Bruin's <laughs> questions, but I think in general, many of the concerns I'd like to have at least comment on it. So. Before I do that and just talk about our goals at SVCE are extremely ambitious. <laughs> extremely ambitious. And you heard from one of the public speakers today, it, the problem isn't getting better, it's getting worse. It requires bold action. That's on the one hand and that's why you all created us, is to do something different. Now we all come from cities. I came from 30 years working for cities, so I have exactly the same kind of concerns about, wait a second, my lawyers have already said, always said, you cannot promote a particular contractor, you can't be in that choosing business. So I think if I can, the takeaway I have is, we'll consult with our general counsel to make sure that what we are doing works under our purchasing policies. And I think within that, I would request, let's get bold about it. Let's do as much as we can. You know, whether it's SMUD, they've already gone through this as a public agency and a utility. So I feel quite confident that, you know, that legal analysis has been done, but mm -hmm. we've heard your comments about it. And maybe in our December meeting, we can bring back how we are addressing these issues. Uh, and then, come up with the contracts. To the extent we have some of the contracts there, we can talk about it first, and if you're comfortable with mm -hmm. uh, how we're addressing the legal issues and the risk to financial risk and reputational risk, I think those are things that we just can't compromise on. Yeah. So once we Absolutely. get past that threshold, then the rest is just design. Let's mm -hmm. do a you know, yeah. bold job with that. That's it. Great, thank you, Director Gibbons and Director Montano. Okay. So thank you, um, I appreciate your comments. Um, I'm usually a scary uh, Nelly here, saying what about risk, what about this, what about that? Um, and I put the um, Gurish about uh, on, the, on that, on the letters and the PG&E status, uh, quite thoroughly, I think. <laughs> um, I think that we have a tremendous advantage here that the SMUD situation, the example, has been vetted for more than two years now. And um, I think it is the case study and it does really answer a lot of our questions. I think staff can come back with um, the experience of SMUD and what worked and didn't work and how they've adjusted um, and in terms of um, the risk and reputation. I think we have to answer those questions, but I actually have a lot of confidence that staff's mm -hmm. already vetted what they're proposing. Yeah. So uh, I'm excited about moving forward um, on this. Great, uh, Director Montano. Uh, oh. Your mic's not mic. on. It doesn't work. Can you, usually the switch is on yeah. the other side. No, I just wanted to say that um, this is a really, I'm just echoing what my colleagues have mentioned. This is a really good 
uh, program online. It gives the customers or the consumers an, uh, an opportunity to, to make some decisions about what type of products that are energy efficient. So this is a really good product. Um, I just want to echo that. It's great. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I too would say this is really exciting. Um, and um, I, and my question actually, it might be a little bit off, but um, when I look at the customer chart, so I think I encountered the rather nots in the last couple of days <laughs> when I was, uh, when we were doing our reach codes. Yeah. And um, so, I, you, you mentioned the coalition, the statewide coalition to raise awareness, and I guess right now that's like to me the most uh, relevant um, because what I discovered in this process was um, there's just a lot of misinformation and non-information, outdated information out there. And I, you know, it's not necessarily to convince the 5% you know, otherwise, I, but I, what I was think, what I was looking for was to be able to reinforce the other, you know, the sustainably rooted, busy suburban, green on the go, those folks to just reaffirm to them that they're on the right track. Um, and this is, you know, maybe personally as a board member and as a represent, I look at as a representative, like I want to be able to have that information on hand and then point folks to the to our website and you know when I get the oh you know, the question about oh this is or you know oh this is dirty electricity well I'd like to be able to say well no it's not and here's the data to back it up so is that part of this resource center um, as well um, or, or is that part of the coalition that we're, we're the building co the coalition? Like, where w well, would I find that kind of information? Yeah, so the, the statewide campaign is going to be driving uh, customers to a single landing point because this, again, it is statewide, so they have to come up with something um, that will give the education about the dangers of natural gas and the need for electrification and mm -hmm. why in California we can go there because of our cleaner electricity. So it's a lot of the messages that you've heard from, from that group um, that will be present. Um, so, and that's also then gonna be a third party entity that isn't also just SVCE saying it because mm -hmm. of course that information will also be available on our site. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the idea and um, so that, that should hopefully be able to be an additional resource in okay. addition to, um, you know, we're still gonna, even with um, reframing our site around the customer resource center, um, still of course have to maintain a lot of the operational aspects and mm -hmm. information about our power supply and things like that. Yeah, um, yeah, a big big goal of the, the statewide campaign mm -hmm. is to start to create consumer pull around yes. some of these, these new solutions. Uh -huh. And like, uh, like so many of you have said, right, there's just a lot of misinformation, in particular old information. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, people's association of electric stoves from way back or... Mm -hmm. Um, toaster style water heaters or whatnot. I mean, the, the, right. the solutions are just a lot <laughs> better now. Uh, they're more efficient, um, they cost less, and this is the kind of thing that, that really needs a lot of, of statewide, uh, well, Awareness. just a lot of publication mm -hmm. in general. And, and so we will hopefully have that as air cover, um, and then we can pick up on those themes in our own site. Great, well, thank so you. I have one more question. Sure. So yes. will, will you be providing, uh, allowing our cities to put a link, your, this link on their, our city website? Is there gonna be technical mm -hmm. assistance or? Well, I think there'd be a price for that. We figured out how to monetize this now, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, no, yeah, of course, yes. We'd, we'd want, uh, we'd, we'd love to have yeah, love to have it linked. Great. Yes, director. Very briefly, um, <clears throat> I got my comments in in a prior committee meeting, and I appreciate staff incorporating them. You know, this is really important because we do, there's fear of the unknown, and so we have to de-risk it. I appreciate that SMUD has done this mm -hmm. formational work 
I mean, it gives me a lot more confidence because I had the same same concerns. <clears throat> um, but you know, I, I, reading the editorial in the Merck on Sunday was it right? Stanford professor probably knows a lot about energy, but his facts are also out of date. And so I've asked staff to see what we could do to to answer these sort of uh, critiques that don't really reflect, um, you know, where we're going and frankly where we need to go. Right? These are 50-year structures. Uh, we're putting up and and we need to to be responsible and give people the new options and you know i know at the air district we've done a lot of the seeding of the market and we've made a lot of progress in helping companies go from you know infancy into into real production with with products I, the state of california has with evs as an example so i think we can do this too and i appreciate our leadership here Great. Um, I'm going to open this to the public, and I do have some th comment cards. We'll start with Mr. Talea. You can skip one if you want to. Hi, uh, again. Um, this is number four. I don't think I've done this many before. Um, <laughs> so, a couple of things. One, uh, from a personal perspective, speaking for myself, um, just, and I used to work at PGE, a former boss of mine started the PGE Marketplace which essentially fits this appliances column of, so if, if you want to see another example, look at marketplace.pge.com and you'll see exactly as Don described. I, you know, it may be one of the same vendors that does it for them as bidding, I don't, really don't know. But they, it's a good example. I just looked at one appliance and you know, it leads to offers from Home Depot and Sears. And um, so that's kind of how it works and you'll see it, it's pretty clear. Um, if you wanted another example. Um, they've had it in place for about five or six years. Uh, and if someone wants to talk to my former boss, I'm happy to make an introduction because she would have known about all the issues that may have come up. Um, also, um, putting on my, my work hat uh, for the Home Intel program, uh, I, in the column of energy use and helping people understand their energy basis, well, first I'll back up. the. Um, I, I was a member of the customer programs advisory group that recommended this and I applaud the effort. I think it's really critical, very needed. Um, I know from my PG&E days that uh, only 5% at most of customers participated in any kind of program so the lift is heavy and in my regular work I you know, see, I talk to customers all the time, residential clients and and they just don't know where to go so this is going to fill a really big need and it's going to be very important and helpful uh, to meeting the ambitious goals that we need to meet so back to my work hat on um, home intel program is uh, already funded by pg e through it's actually pg e ratepayers all of us are paying for these programs public purpose programs another example is the bay run run by association of bay area um, governments they run the home plus program um, similar to the Home Intel program, you know, we have energy coaches, and I'm an energy coach. Uh, they have energy advisors to help people understand their energy use. So I'm just hopeful, and I haven't had a chance to talk recently with the team, um, that, that this tool will help point people to existing programs that are already funded by them and serve them, uh, like the Bayren program and the program that I, I do work on. Thanks. Thank you. And Mr. Bruce Nagel. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to you about this. Um, there is a similar uh, entity that is in the uh, sustainability plan that Mountain View has put out. It was put out at a time when it wasn't clear which of these, pro how the, all these things would evolve. So I, I wanted to make sure that there was a placeholder inside of the uh, Mountain View sustainability uh, plan to address this. And I think what that leads to is it says is that we probably need to think about one, when I, when I wrote the requirement, I wanted to understand how to, to be able to work with uh, SVC, because you guys were talking about funding and Garish had made a wonderful offer and said, you know, we'd help uh, put the database in place because it was, it was going to be difficult to do that. So I think it would be good to do that. I also think that there may be other cities who, I think one of the components that hasn't been mentioned or just hinted at is, what are you gonna do in each of the individual cities? Can we do something to customize it so each city gets a different view of things? That might be a way to help uh, move it forward. So probably we should talk afterward. 
Great. Um, and then, oh, Bruce Carney, Mr. Carney. Thank you. Um, this is, as Giresh said, absolutely an important problem to solve. The level of investment that homeowners and businesses are going to need to make in replacing natural gas and gasoline powered equipment with electrically powered equipment is enormous. Um, and in that context, I have to say that selling $3.5 million in two years is not enormous. Um, it's about two orders of magnitude less than enormous. And the fact that the products that are being sold through this channel at an average price of less than $100 means that it is not an example of the channel that will move heat pump water heaters, heat pump dryers, uh, mini splits, or the other kinds of things that need to be moved. Um, Twelve years ago, I worked for Solar City, uh, and I was the director of community programs. And what that meant was that I would go to cities, many of your cities, and look for a local champion who could act as my credible front person and offer a deep discount to residents of those cities uh, if they would buy a lot of solar city solar systems all at the same time. Um, it was enormously successful in Mountain View, the first place that I ever tried to do that. We sold over three and a half million dollars of solar systems in three months. Um, but when I went back to Mountain View a year later to try to sell more, uh, the program pretty much sank because I had scooped up all the green mountain viewers in the first pass and there was not many left the second time around. So I had to go to Cupertino and Los Altos and Los Altos Hills and Sunnyvale. Um, but we never ran a successful second pass program. After Solar City invented the solar lease, uh, the CEO, Lyndon Rive, went down to San Jose and got an, a meeting with Chuck Reed's chief of staff. And he, I was with him, and he wanted San Jose to endorse Solar City's new solar lease, uh, which at the time was the only opportunity to get a solar system on lease for no money down. And Chuck said, well, I can't do that just for you, but here's what I could do. We could run a program where any solar company that offered a zero down lease would be eligible, and any solar company that didn't do that wouldn't be eligible. So there was a San Jose-based solar company called Bayohana that said, we can offer that too. And within a year, the president of Bayohana was arrested and he went to jail because he was a complete con artist. Oops, okay, negative learning there. We need to not do that. Um, any opportunity that involves a contractor is gonna have capacity constraints. Solar City at the time, really wanted to be the biggest solar company in the United States, and they got there within 12 months of their founding. Most contractors have no growth ambitions, they have stability ambitions. They want to not lay people off, and they're very leery about hiring lots of new people, because guess what? There are quality issues with your newest employees that don't exist with your older employees. So any contractor-driven program has to deal with the fact that there will be many different companies involved, and that lead times for those companies that you promote will stretch, which, if they're not disclosed, will make customers unhappy. Um, I could say more, but I'll just add one, one final thing, which was during the days when California offered a rebate for solar customers, which flowed through the installer, typically. Typically, the installer would say, you're going to get a $2,000 rebate. I'll take the rebate, I, the, the and contractor will take it, and I'll give it, it to you as a credit up front, so you will not have to worry about the float of this state rebate. Well, the state required data from their installers. So if you wanted to get the rebate, you had to fill out all the paperwork, and part of the paperwork was pricing. So the state database would show you the price for every job in your zip code from every company that served that zip code. So you could learn really interesting things about which vendors <clears throat> were offering good prices and which were not. But they also had a five strikes and you're out clause in there. So that if, I can't remember what exactly it was that constituted a strike, but if you got five of them, you could not get any more rebates anymore forever. And of course, as Solar City grew, 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 we were much more exposed to the five strikes than some small solar company. So, uh, we actually got the state to change the rules, so it was based on a percentage of sales, not just on five strikes. 
All this is really complicated, and to speak to the concerns about the risks and about cities don't do this, government agencies don't do this, I understand that. And I don't know exactly how to break through that barrier because what has to happen here is essentially selling. And selling is not something that most elected officials do outside of election season when they sell themselves. Um, when somebody asks me, hey Bruce, I'm thinking of solar, who should I call? I give them two company names. I have not had my solar installed by either of those companies, but wandering around through the valley and through life, I've come to believe that these two companies are highly credible, good folks, and I haven't heard back that they're not. Uh, I have some concerns about Yelp. I believe that in some cases Yelp uh, is exploited by people who want to be paid off uh, by, let's say, a chiropractor who they give a bad, recommend, re bad review to, even if they were never a patient of that chiropractor. And I have heard instances where Yelp uh, has reason to believe that reviews are fake, but doesn't work on getting them off. So they, in, unless the chiropractor pays them to do so. So there's, there's concerns about all of that. Uh, but ultimately, it has to come down to something that's very, very easy and leads to action. The Educate, Inspire, Act, or Inspire, Educate, Act is a very important ladder. And if you give people too many choices rather than just two or three, they won't get to the act step. So I think this is critical. Uh, it isn't, doesn't feel like it's quite ready to be something that will both inspire customers to work and inspire you with the confidence that you're not going to get sued or a black eye. Uh, but I hope that in the next month or two, uh, the solution to the puzzle will be revealed. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm going to, any other members wishing to speak from the public? If not, I'm close. I will close public comment. Uh, this was a discussion, so no, no action. Any last comments? No. If not, uh, we will move to se item seven, executive committee report uh, by me. The executive committee met October 25th and discussed the customer resource center and virtual power plant programs and received information on member agency results communication, which is, I believe, this sheet, and the 2020 SVCE board elections timeline. The group also approved to recommend the amendments to SVCE's operating rules and regulations on consent. Next committee meeting is scheduled for November 22nd, 9 a.m. at the SVC office. Any questions or comments on that? Any members of the public wishing to speak on that? If not, we will move to board Sorry, member. Uh, yes, so the next executive, it's executive committee. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to <laughs> sit in. <laughs> um, and so we will now move to board member announcements and direction on future agenda items. Are there any announcements? Let's go down here. Go down the road. Thank you. I'll just, I don't want to repeat in depth, but I, I do want to say I, I thought it would be appropriate to give a report since I did attend the Cal CCA meeting. For me, it was, um, I'm a new board member. I very much enjoyed it. Uh, it was a great opportunity to hear all of the issues that we talk about here, and it feels very localized, but to actually go and see that there's so many different organizations who are really in the weeds working on this. It was so encouraging. Talk about inspiring and acting. I, I definitely came home feeling very encouraged about the efforts that we're making making me realize again that it's a group think problem. Um, regions working together, CCAs working together. It was just such such an incredible um, sight. And to all be in one room, different elected, serving on different boards of the CCAs, the ideas that came out of that, um, talking about the, the importance of labor, being included in the PG&A deal, and really um, kind of understanding how they really do so much of that work and that they could could be a very important stopgap. We need to make sure that we kind of reach out and include that whole group. Um, they will be the people that are that have the knowledge and the know-how to carry all this out. Um, talking about how we 
we include minorities in this whole change. So, um, and and just one point that that I was I was sharing actually with the colleagues that I had met there and all throughout the state was. You know, we need to look at, at the cultures as well. And, and one thing I was talking about with PG&E is down in Mexico, your electricity, your water can easily be shut off with no notice at all whatsoever. And that's just kind of a way of life. And so when you have some of these populations who, you know, PG&E is a branded name. And if you're asking them to give up um, that branded name and to go with maybe a CCA, I mean, that's a big, that's a big ask because they've really come to enjoy those privileges. And so I think that if we really want to encourage and, and capture all that 5%, we need to, we need to rethink how we approach this. And so that was, that was a big moment for me um, that I'm selfishly with you now <laughs> because it was just such a big revelation that I came away with so tell us about Great. your gas my gas oh that would be really good to get that up hopefully not your gas <laughs> well no I think he means <laughs> so we did look at it must have been let's see last Wednesday it was accepted we adopted the ordinance but the two weeks prior was when we looked at um the possibility of, of banning natural gas in Morgan Hill. And we had a, a pretty good majority at that point. Then over the next two weeks, there was lots of commentary and lots of discussion in the public about, and, and as I was sharing earlier, I think there was lots of fear. Um, this was all happening kind of simultaneously as we were having the PGA, PG&E shutdown. And people were just thinking, you know, I was able to use my gas here. You're asking me to give that up. What does that mean? And so for me, it was very helpful to learn. Um, I had other people in the community come to me and say, hey, listen, I, I understand that they're bringing up this point, but don't forget, as um, Director Corrigan was saying, that it was it was an important part to why the shutdowns continued and that some of them had no gas the whole time. So that was something important that I learned. Um, developers were concerned, some, some of the developers were concerned on how that would work. And, um, and so it was pulled from consent the second when we went to adopt the ordinance. But um, I had come on my way back from Cal CCA and barely made it back to the dais and we were able to go ahead and, and pass that. So I'm really proud. Um, to say that we've joined some of the other cities and I, I know more will come along. So thank you all and, and thank you for the opportunity. Great, thank you and congratulations. Uh, Director Ellenberg? Uh, Santa Clara County has also passed REACH code, so I'm excited about that. Um, proud to share that information. And I wanna really thank you okay. because in your comments tonight, um, Yvonne, you raised both uh, equity and cultural uh, responsive issues and I think that those lenses are critically important and without them we are risking losing uh, the attention of big chunks of the population whether it's folks who just say you know electric vehicles are for people who are rich and I can't afford to mm -hmm. um, redo things in my house we don't want electrification to be seen as a luxury yes. item something that you can only do if you have some disposable income. So I think working with working on that challenge is important. And the the point that you just made right now about the um, cultural specificities of PG&E being a recognized brand and respected, misguided maybe, but um, <laughs> but familiar and certainly in comparison reliable. Um, so I just want to highlight the points that you've made because I think that they really are important and as we go forward with our communication plan I would like to see that we have both an, an equity lens and a cultural culturally specific one what were your reach codes for the county hmm? what were the reach codes for the county um, yeah I hear the question I'm just thinking <laughs> <laughs> was it is it was it uh, incentive mandate yeah. all electric uh, incentive all electric okay future Thank you. Anything else? For unincorporated. Yes. 
every bit counts. Reach codes, I think, is coming before us next Tuesday. Oh. I think we have like eight Tuesdays in a row of council meetings. <laughs> so. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, I attended um, also the, the Cal CCA conference. It was wonderful, and I encourage others to take advantage in the future. And uh, for all the reasons uh, that have, men have been mentioned and meeting everyone doing different things across the state was very informative. And the new ones coming online and the excitement and, 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 and substantive number was great. Um, and also um, Campbell will be doing the REACH code uh, on Tuesday. Great, yes. So Thanks Saratoga, share. we gave direction to staff on the REACH codes. We landed in a slightly different place than probably any other city, um, okay, which you would, expect, <laughs> you would expect. You would expect. What we did was we did ban gas for space and water heating, <clears throat> but not for cooking and drying. Mm -hmm. We do require, right. yeah, we do require everything for electric. The way it came down for our city was the battlefront for us was the cook cook surfaces <laughs> and rather than have the fight we decided we would let the market decide but if you eliminated the space and hot water heating you got 90 you know 86 percent of the benefit so we kind of dialed it in that way um, I will point out that I got my consumer reports 2020 today and the top rated cooktops are again the uh, five induction cooktops they mm. beat all the others mm. dual fuel gas and everything not by a point but by like four or five points so the market is going to win this. <laughs> the other thing that we did, which was a little odd, was on the um, EV. We require two EV hookups per house, one pre-wired, one can be conduit only, but one has to be inside and one has to be outside. Hmm. So we kind of, yeah, we kind of spliced that thing because a lot of people hmm. have full garages. <laughs> so again, it isn't exactly anybody else's reach code. <laughs> But I think we got the essence of what we were trying to do. We were going to do it at our last meeting, but because of the fire code changes, which weren't properly incorporated, we continued the hearing, um, and we'll pick it up next time. And oddly, other than some of our regulars here, um, nobody's showing up at our meetings complaining one way or the other. Mm. There's a few emails. Yeah. So I think that we're, you're going to see this weird Saratoga variation come forward. Not 100% gas ban, but at least some. And it also applies to new, and in our city, a remodel of 50% or more, mm. which is a large percentage yes. of our bigger remodels, they classify as new. So while we don't do a lot of new housing developments, we <laughs> will pick up a lot of houses through remodel. Great, thank you. Oh. And one last thing, I got, LED light bulbs at, at Costco for 99 cents for six. <laughs> Limit two per customer. <laughs> okay. I would say that was an endorsement, yes. <laughs> you know, that <laughs> Are you getting paid by Costco? Yeah. All right. Uh, yes. Dr. I, I got ahead of myself because I was so excited to be part of the, uh, the big kids here. No worries. We did not pass them yet. We have submitted a referral to our administration to come back okay. with a suggestion for them. I have high confidence that we will sure. pass them, but we're not quite there yet. Well, we will look forward to the good news. I know, right? <laughs> All right. We're Wednesday. Next we're we're Wednesday. next week. We, we have our hearing next Wednesday. I am, uh, remain hopeful that they'll pass um, in Los Altos Hills uh, in some variation. I really appreciated John's presentation to our council, um, and you've worked so um, uh, well with our subcommittees and so I'm really hopeful it'll come right on up no problem it has been coupled to our fire codes so I'm eager to talk to you after the meeting and understand what hiccups you had I'm a little concerned about them being together and I wish they would have been apart but ours was only clerical okay good just getting all good the right you us. scared me okay <laughs> good no interference but what are you guys doing or do you know uh, we'll, we'll see <laughs> are you gonna ban guests? I'll let you know at December's meeting. <laughs> <laughs> It'll cost you. <laughs> All right, Dr. Sinks. Uh, in Cupertino, I've been trying to feed Bino into this, uh, into our staff for a long time. Shut down on that. That is a fossil fuel. <laughs> you got the joke? Okay, fine. <laughs> but uh, what, I, what I would really want to appreciate and recognize is, Margaret, your leadership in Mountain View. Yeah. Because 
Um, yeah. So, so I watched the meeting. Oh, you did again. <laughs> no, not the last one. I watched the first one. And, and I knew two days later, our sustainability commission was meeting. And we had, frankly, you know, among the weakest of the staff recommendations going into that. As a result of Mountain View's leadership, you know, who, who wants to be a laggard? Um, we, uh, we got, quickly got from Mountain View staff, right, a, a readout on what they'd done, a short readout. Um, and, and the Sustainability Commission said, we want to be like Mountain View. And so staff subsequently, in their staff report for council, a council meeting next Tuesday, basically uh, adopted the Sustainability Commission's recommendation. Yeah. Thank, so th thank you for your leadership, because I think you, you. you kicked off the, the deliberation uh, and, and <laughs> ma made a big difference, right, in, in changing things. So uh, I just want to recognize that, because I, I think we we need leaders and we need followers. And you know, on something like climate, the truth is, if all you do is lead, it doesn't make that much difference. This is a global commons problem, right? We, we need other areas of the state and the world to follow uh, uh, leadership. And it doesn't necessarily come from here, but in this case, it's come from, yes, Berkeley and, and Mountain View. So um, I just want to recognize that. I was, uh, we were supposed to go at the first meeting in November that was supposed to be our first reading. Now we've downgraded to um, just a study session, so God help me, I don't know when we're gonna finish this, but, but um, you know, at least the staff recommendation got, got upgraded, and um, I'm looking forward to the discussion on Tuesday. Well, thank you for being on top of the issue and pushing it along. Appreciate that. Director. Could I just make a request of staff? I think many of our, in our cities, yes. we don't have the latest information mm -hmm. about what each city has done. Yes. I would really appreciate a current website that's updated after every council action. Mm -hmm. So when I walk in on Tuesday, I know what all the other cities have done. We'll have that up tomorrow. Okay. And I just ask you to keep refreshing it until yep. we get to, I don't know, Monte Serene. No, never mind. <laughs> no, we have well, whoever is going to be the, no problem. right? You know what I'm saying, right? I think I think there's a lot of uh, value in yes to sharing and yeah great director Smith any announcements yes I do as a matter of fact <laughs> I'll start out I suppose yeah I'll just go chronologically so since our last meeting as many of you are aware there was a League of California Cities event and I was very delighted mm -hmm. to hang out with Beth Vaughn a little bit at the um, women's caucus mm -hmm. event and cal cca was one of the sponsors and this is the second year in the row and as i did last year i encouraged cal cca to get a booth in the expo hall because as mm -hmm. you all know that's where a lot of people wander around and get um relaxed and uh, informed mm -hmm. at the same time um ice cream bars in a um in a venue where there's some alcohol and you know food and uh, time to talk and mm -hmm. um, reach out to vendors. So um, she was saying that they are expanding so fast that mm -hmm. they just haven't had the bandwidth to get oh. it to get it together to um, to have a a booth at the expo. But they're looking forward to doing that next year, and I'm hoping they'll also continue their sponsorship. So um, <laughs> it was fabulous to hang out with with her and um, we didn't get the photo booth photo together this time, but um, I'm sure we'll fix that next year. Um, then s the second thing that I wanted to s tell you was that um, Sunnyvale, ho our uh, sustainability commission mm -hmm. hosted an event mm -hmm. called on Saturday called, um, the oh, what was it called? Uh, Electric Cars Demystified. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, put on by Evucation, I think mm -hmm. I'm saying that right. And they had a um, opportunity for people to show off their electric vehicles, and there were rides given to people who wanted to look look at them. And I have left the hydrogen fold and gone with the mm -hmm. Prius Prime. Yes. <laughs> so I now yes. 
<laughs> so I know I even showed my car, even though I didn't park it in the main area because I haven't, I hadn't actually charged it at that time. <laughs> but it turns out there was a charge point guy who gave me the charge point card, <laughs> and so I was able to charge my car later that day Great. at City Hall. So um, I learned a lot. Uh, and there were probably about a hundred people there in the theater. And uh, one of the things that I noticed was that um, people were very, very interested in the cost effectiveness of cars. Mm -hmm. They did talk about equity and that there is a very uh, rich and widely available used market for electric cars. And so mm -hmm. you could get like a Nissan Leaf for about 4,000. As, and so there, there are some equity. Um, I appreciated that they covered that as well. And there were people in the audience who, who um, appreciated that too. So not everybody needs to get Teslas. You hear about Teslas, but there are many cost-effective options. So I learned a lot. I encourage you to invite them to your cities to educate people because it was really well attended and everybody appreciated it, it seemed like. And then lastly, um, Sunnyvale did have a study session on reach codes mm -hmm. where, where John Stupp, Stupp attended and actually made a few comments, but he didn't make the main presentation. I think um, I have, our staff presented the, the concept that Sunnyvale has been having a broader form of reach code since 2006 with our green building program. So, you know, okay. Um, nevertheless, council did instruct them to come back as soon as possible with an actual reach code. So we'll see how they, hmm. they proceed with that, but. Yes or no guess. <laughs> we gave recommendations, um, not favor, I mean, the, the staff, you know, each, I mean, the council each gave their own opinion, but gas wasn't widely popular. I'll just say that. So, Great. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. Next. Okay, <laughs> Los Gatos. So, um, officially, our, our meeting to discuss this was pushed back to December 17. Wow. But um, okay. we did something risky in that at our last council meeting that our building codes for 2020, including our fire codes, were on the agenda. And since we were having difficulty in getting reach codes even on the agenda, we basically said we weren't discussing anything until reach codes comes. Wow. So yeah. um, we're pushing it back like to the 17th. Resist. I know, my manager <laughs> gave me that same look. <laughs> <laughs> so it's risky, but at least we're hoping that pushes the urgency on staff. Um, nice. Individually, we've been been weighing in on what we'd like the versions to see. I think our town manager will be reaching out just basically uh, to see what each city has done up to date so that um, when we have our discussion on the 17th, hopefully we'll have quick yes. agreement um, and we could do first and second reading soon after that. So, all right. Wish me luck. Good yeah, luck. Fantastic. All right. Go. Hashtag resist, right? Yes. <laughs> so yes, that's, that's an interesting date, December 17th, because that's when the offer that the city of Maricino made to the mayor of uh, Los Gatos oh. to become our city manager starts. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering if there's any connection, but I probably not. <laughs> uh, Maricino, a tough time. We had about 16 letters opposing, uh, uh, opposing mm. whatever we were trying to do. Our mayor, uh, who really believes in the climate not changing, basically read each one of those records on oh <laughs> letters goodness. on the record, took the time to do it. Um, so there was uh, the letter from the city of Montecino, uh, the, uh, Mountain View adoption helped. I, I put, put that on the agenda, and Morgan Hill's letter was also on the agenda. She didn't read those, but anyway, <laughs> it, was, it, was <laughs> it, it was there. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, the staff recommendation came in with a couple of options on what we could adopt it. Gas, no gas was not one of the options because mm -hmm. the city was really upset about that. Mm -hmm. uh, Montecino has a lot of gas, so they, they, they <laughs> 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 Human or otherwise. <laughs> so, so, so what we are uh, what we are looking at adopting and to. Uh, at least two council uh, members adopted uh, the, all the electric versions of the reach code plus the storage uh, unit also. Oh, and uh, one isn't sure about the storage yet, so we'll find out. It should be on next uh, Tuesday's agenda. 
Right. Hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll have some reach codes. You know, there may be That's really good. light reach codes, but they'll be there. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Good job. Any announcements from so, you, Dr. Shimon? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that Let's move over work. to the mic okay. that works. <laughs> so in our city, it was a mixed, um, it was a hodgepodge. Uh, we decided not to do our reach codes at this moment. Uh, and the reason why is the cost. We're very conscientious about the cost to a lot of the businesses and the consumers. That's the, that was the driving decision, um, not to do the reach codes. However, it, it, we still are gonna use gasoline and gas and, and electricity, so it's a mixed use. So. And, but it's, it's, we want it to be a gradual, not just do it all of a sudden. And we did get some letters from the unions, from the electrical yes. unions. They're really pushing for that, so. For reach codes. Uh, yes. For it. They yes. want, they so want it. IBEW, so through our CEO sent a letter in support of us moving forward with our reach codes. Yes, and PG&E. Um, so, uh, yes, we have quite a bit of support there. Yeah, I, I just want to make one more comment. Uh, the alternate director from Montesino, uh, Liz Lawler, is, was also very supportive of this thing, so yes. continue to reach out to her on that. Yes, I do want to thank all of you for your um, leadership on this issue. I, I mentioned it at my meeting that a year ago when our C SVCE staff brought this up, I, had n I didn't think we were going to get anywhere, to be honest. You know, Sunnyvale said they'd do it, so I was like, okay, let's do it with them. <laughs> but um, my staff, I'm, you know, I, I want to thank staff here for all of your support. I think because of the work that was done here, it made it much easier for our city staff to move on, move on it. And um, you know, I, I want to thank my staff in Mountain View. Um, we have a wonderful building official who said, you know, if council wants this done, we're going to get it done. And so um, we were able to have our second reading last night and pass pass it. Um, with and I have to say, you know, I should have expected some pushback, but the first reading went pretty smoothly. And then the, vo the local paper wrote about it, I guess last weekend. I didn't see the article, but suddenly I started getting these emails. And, um, you know, we talk about diversity and women. And, and um, you know, I, I used my daughters as, you know, part of my reason for moving this forward because my girls, they, you know, seriously fear that the world is going to end in their lifetime. And one of the, I guess, you know, I try not to get too upset, but when, uh, you know, a, so a gentleman writes to me and says, you know, don't be such, such an emotional decision maker and tell your, you should be a good mother and tell your children that the, world, the sky is not falling, I'd had to respond to that. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I just said, um, you know, our young people get it. I mean, they, are, they, they get it. And today, even with the, the second graders, it's just amazing that these young people get, get this and really take this seriously. And so it's about time that the adults get it too. So um, I'm very excited. I think this is a huge accomplishment. You know, regardless of where we are, we're moving forward. And I think that's really key. And so thank you to staff here. Thank you to all of you. Um, quite an accomplishment, so something to be proud of. And I know we went way over time and we still have a closed session, but I think there's just, you know, it's an exciting time, so. Remind everybody, if you don't make January 1st, they can still attend. Yes, that is true. So January 1st is the building code, the three-year cycle, but if it doesn't happen by then, it's not that it can't happen, it just makes it a little bit more challenging, but I'm sure you know we can get assistance to make it happen. Um, the issue of cost, I, that's always, you know, that's always the, the argument. Um, and I think that's, well, so it's interesting, we had, um, we had City Ventures come and say, you know, they're doing all electric, and then we had another developer come in and say, it's you know dirty electricity. It costs more this and that. But I actually went back to another member of that development community uh, or developer, and they actually told me that they did a cost benefit analysis and it came out neutral um, for most. I think there's one type of home that it might be a little bit more expensive, but um, you know it is a, It's I think it's going to be market driven too. So. 
Um, we have some work to do, though. Uh, we received a letter from the, and I, you know, I don't mean to out him, but I will, that the leadership group wrote in asking us to do a cost-benefit analysis on the EV charging station requirements, and I was a little surprised to get that from them, but um, you know, I think there's still lots of conversation that we can, we can have. Yes, that's, that's why I was surprised. You, you, you <laughs> know, one of, one of the effective arguments that I heard you make in that first meeting was the idea if we're, we're asking commercial multifamily buildings, mm -hmm. right, to, to go uh, to be gas free, why should we give a break to uh, single family homeowners? Yes. I mean, we, we ought to be, right? Universal. Yes. Yeah. We, yeah. Well, it, I thought, that's a matter of equity, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. And we did get a few folks who are building their own single family homes upset at us. Um, and, and yeah, we're you know we're not going to please everyone, but right. I think that it, it is an equity issue too. So yes, uh, just one comment on EV charges. Um, a lot of uh, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers are going to EVs because it's uh, yeah. cheaper for them to run those, and there are programs that are available for mm -hmm. them that it makes it worth it. So uh, having EV charges everywhere is helpful even to even. Yeah. To, to the low-income individuals that are driving Ubers. Agreed. Um, I guess there is like a, a increased cost with the yeah. installation, yeah. and that's what they were arguing. Right. Or so, so right using. now they're charging it somewhere else. I mean, they don't, they don't have a charger right. in their house, so they have to go someplace else to get a charger. Yes. Great. Any? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Second round. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just wanted to. <laughs> I, I thought it was important enough to say. I really wanted to thank John because he was instrumental in helping us in Morgan yes. Hill. He did a fantastic job. And Don. He too. weathered all of the questions. It, it was really pretty impressive. Um, I also want to thank um, Tony Yulo. He was very mm -hmm. instrumental in that as well. You all know him, and and he's fantastic, and we're we're so grateful to have him. And I wanted to just say that the gas ranges were a big point for those who are looking at sure. it coming through this next week and, and the following week. In Morgan Hill, it was certainly a very contentious point of the gas ranges as well, people wanting to cook and enjoying cooking and all that. So that's something to talk about, you know, luxury versus where mm -hmm. we have to go. Um, and then the developer, one of the requests was that we delay it, I think, um, I can't remember specificity. I think it was 90 days, so they wanted to have more of a delay on that. And so these are just might be some of the things that you see. Good luck. Um, I do want to thank Don Bray, too, because he showed up at a lot of the council meetings. And, and then I forgot, I, um, you know, we're, as we're thanking everyone, I want to thank our citizen crew, uh, Bruce and James and Bruce and um, the Carbon Free folks, because when we started getting the flurry of, you know, the what is it called? Rather not. They jumped in and started responding, and so that's, that's right. Thank very you. Helpful. So, so, so thank we, you, to everyone. Um, should, should, should we just do a clap for everybody? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, guys. All right. With that, um, is there any public? Oh, so we do have a closed session. Is there any public comment on the closed session item? If not, um, we will convene in the kitchen to a closed session uh, conference with real, the, the meeting room, conference with real property negotiators, property, do I need to read all the properties? No, we're fine. Okay, so um, agency negotiator is Girish Balachandran, CEO, negotiating parties, Newmark Knight Frank, under negotiation price and terms of payment. And we'll be back with a report. <laughs>